So, welcome to the afternoon session. So, it's my pleasure to introduce you to Siddhartha. Siddhartha is the head of the Brain Institute of Natal. So, Siddhartha, please. Thank you. Obrigado, Claudio. So, hello, everybody. Uh, I was trying to bring down the number of slides and try to get a more condensed message, but, of course, you always want to tell your story, right? Um, so if you think it's too much detail, just just say, come on, move on, and I'll, and I'll move on, okay? Um, originally, I thought that I was going to uh, prepare like a general lecture on memory, like a, like almost like a, you know, like a textbook kind of, of, of lecture. But then uh, I was talking to Claudia, and she's emphasized the need to, to really talk about the specifics of my research. So that's why I put the name, the name uh, Sleep Dependent Mechanisms, which was not in the program, but that's what I do. So that's what I'm going to discuss with you. And there are specifically two things that I want to show you that I think are very amenable to modeling or very amenable to the kind of, of thinking that uh, we, we've been dealing with here. Um, so... Of course, you can trace the origins of, 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 what, of the concept of memory. Could you just oh. uh, look at the connection? Boom. Um, you can go back to, to the pre-Socratics. You can go back to Plato to talk about memory. But in, in, in contemporary terms, in, in, in what we call now psychology, uh, memory is something that started to be defined at the end of the 19th century by William James and, and other researchers, and in particular by, by Hermann Ebbinghaus, who was, uh, in the late 19th century, one of the most important psychologists. And one of the important things that, that he discovered, and, and it seems like a, an obvious thing that everybody should know, you know uh, from scratch, is the notion that, that memories decay exponentially. That if you, if you learn, let's say, uh, 20 syllables that do not exist in your language, that, you know, artificial syllables. And then uh, I ask you some hours later how many of those syllables you remember, you will see uh, this, what he called the forgetting curve. You'll see that, that uh, in the beginning you have a very good, um, let me see if I can make this work. No. Uh, is there a laser pointer? Well, I, don't, I don't need it. So you can see here that you know, in the beginning you learn, say, 50 new syllables, but then the next day you only remember 20, and then the next day uh, uh, 10, and so on and so on. So it basically it's, it's, it's dropping dramatically. If you get uh, some retraining, what happens is the slope of this decay changes. But it's still, in a way, the same sort of principle. Um, now, this is a very general uh, um, discovery of psychology or psychophysics, if you want, um, but how does that relate to the brain? How, how, what are the different kinds of memory? Are all the memories created equal? And, and the answer is no. Um, depending on the kind of memory we're talking about, we're talking about different circuits in the brain. So if I ask you about any fact, any event, a person you met, uh, a city you visited, a story, okay, this is what we call declarative memory. These are memories that you can declare, that you can tell people about. Right? I can tell you about the hist you know, what, when my grandmother came uh, from Rio de Janeiro to Brasilia. I can tell you a story. All this depends on circuits that involve the hippocampus, a part of the brain that is very old, and, and the cortex. Okay? It's different portions of the cortex. Um, in contrast, if you're talking about uh, a habit that you have, so for example, I like to ride a bicycle. Okay? I like to play tennis. I drive to work. Those things do not depend a lot on the hippocampus. Actually, navigation depends on the hippocampus, but the motor execution of, of anything is hippocampus independent. A person that lacks a hippocampus can learn how to ride a bike. Okay? Uh, and we call these memories the, the, the procedural memories, uh, skills and habits in general. This depends a lot on a different part of the brain called the striatum or, or the basal ganglia, you know, as we call them collectively. The striatum is the dorsal part of that. Uh, and depends also on the cerebellum, depends also on, in, on, on the motor cortex. Uh, they do interact. I mean, the, the notion that these systems do not interact is not 
correct. But at least, you know, in, in, in general terms, we, we really talk about them as separate entities. Um, you have classical conditioning, with the, which depends a lot on the cerebellum. This is also a very basic kind of learning that is hippocampus independent. You have emotional responses, which depend on this part of the brain that is called the amygdala, uh, which is not the same thing as the tonsils in your mouth, right? Um, and then you have another kind of memory, which is not really listed here, which is the very short-term kind of memory that we call working memory, which depends on prefrontal circuits. So if I tell you, you know, my, my phone number, and if you need it for the next five minutes, you will not commit it to memory, you'll not write it down to, to, you know, to hippocampal cortical circuits, because you, you won't need this information later on. I will focus the rest of this talk, everything that I will talk from here on, uh, is uh, coming from the work on the hippocampal cortical loop, basically hippocampus dependent memories. Okay, although maybe, I mean, some of the more general uh, theoretical things that we will be able to come up with at the end, the general framework may be applicable to other systems as well. Um, as Antonio is coming in, uh, ah, very good. To learn better. Me too, actually. I had a nap in New Mech. Um, how does this work? Okay. So this is, this is a, a very famous patient in the, in the history of neuroscience. His name <clears throat> was Henry Molasson. We only learned this when he died, uh, what, three, four years ago. So everybody knows him by his initials, HM, right? Everybody that is from the neuroscience field here, you know, this is like uh, Mickey Mouse. You know, we know the name. Of, it's like it's in all, every single textbook, you know patient HM. What happened to patient HM is that he had epilepsy with foci in both hippocampus, in both sides. And so in the, in the 40s and 50s, people were very um, eager to do psychosurgery, basically go and remove parts of your brain. You, you may still need this kind of surgery in given certain you know, conditions, but it's not as easy as before to, to get the treatment that he got. The treatment that he got was basically the removal of the source of, 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 of uh, seizures, which was the hippocampus, and he got cured of the, of the seizures forever. But he also developed, for the rest of his life, uh, uh, an in incurable amnesia. He could no longer learn anything that depends on the hippocampus. So all the facts, all the events, all the people, all the places he visited, from then on, were, um, were not, not committed to long-term memory. So he, you could be introduced to him, he would know your name in, in, in short-term uh, working memory for a few minutes, and then after a few minutes, he would say, oh, nice to meet you. you know? And this happened to his doctors throughout his life. Um, and this is interesting because it, 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 well, it was very bad for him, but it, it's interesting for science. Uh, it, it really made it clear that these kind of memories require the hippocampus in order to be acquired. It doesn't mean that the memories are stored only in the hippocampus, which is an interpretation that people gave in the beginning, and then it's not true. But it means that the hippocampus is required for the memories to be established. I would say most people nowadays believe that the quality of the memories is never really stored in the hippocampus. Perhaps the spatial quality, yes, but not the sensory quality. Okay, what it seems to be stored in the hippocampus, uh, Ozami, uh, I know, has ideas about this, is how the quality, the, the, the different kinds of qualities of a memory go together. So, for example, if I, if I look at Antonio, I have an image of him, but I also have an auditory memory of his voice, and I also have, uh, I know how he's, uh, he, 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 when I touch him, I know how he feels. All those things together are, are what I call the representation of Antonio in my mind, and that representation is stored in the cortex, but it, the way that I assemble the visual, the auditory, the somatosensory, and all the different qualities is through the hippocampus. So the hippocampus is an arbitrary index of those qualities, right? Uh, this is a big debate in the field, okay? Uh, and the pe people believe this is so because the hippocampus is not really, um, if you look at that anatomically, it's, it doesn't seem like the best place in the world to store quality of things, right? The hippocampus is connected to... to the entorhinal cortex back and forth, it's connected to the prefrontal cortex, it receives information from all sorts of sensory modalities and sends it back. 
So the notion that the entire memory is really stored in the hippocampus is probably not true. But in the very beginning, if you don't have it, you cannot even start to create the memory. Because you cannot index and say, oh, you know, this pitch or voice goes together with this, with this appearance which is stored in the visual cortex. Um, what was also very interesting in AGM's uh, clinical case is the fact that he developed anterograde amnesia, so amnesia for the rest of his life from then on, but also retrograde amnesia. So he forgot, for example, everything that was related to his own surgery. So he forgot everything that happened in the, in the weeks that preceded the surgery. But he did not forget anything about his childhood. And that was very important. That was the moment when people said, actually Hebb in 42 was publishing stuff to that effect. He was starting to guess. But then in, with, with, with HM, then people said, okay, so memories are hippocampus dependent for a while, but eventually they get to be hippocampus independent. Because if I remove the hippocampus of a 40 years old guy, he will remember his childhood okay, which means this, this memory cannot possibly be in the hippocampus. Uh, most people believe this today, but there's a recent experimental data suggesting that the memories are never really completely erased from the hippocampus. There's always a little bit of a, of a trace in the hippocampus, and if you're able to use that trace, you can still play with that memory remotely. Okay, but for practical purposes, if you remove the hippocampus of an adult, the, the old memories are going to be intact. Okay, so now how does this ha that happen? What is the process by which memories that mostly engage the hippocampus when they are young, over time get to be corticalized? Nobody knows the answer, and, and I've been pursuing for many years the notion that sleep is actually related to this process. And I'm going to show a lot of uh, empirical evidence that this is the case. And as I was talking to Azami earlier on, earlier this, this morning, uh, one of the, my interests here in Neuromat, specific interests, is to model this process. I have a toy model of this process. I would like to have a, a better toy. Um, of course, everybody here knows what sleep is. We all sleep every night. Is, is there anybody here that does not sleep every night? It's very rare, right? You may, sleep, you may sleep little, but you do sleep every night unless you have a serious, you know, jeopardized uh, schedule. Uh, now, dream is a different story, right? Most people don't remember their dreams regularly, uh, but most people know what a dream is. I mean, most people remember having a dream at some point in their lives, right? If we have time, I will get to talk about dreams in the end because this is what... Um, uh, we were talking before with Remco about the, the graphs and how can you use dream reports in psychiatry. So, so let's move on. If we're going to talk about sleep and dreams and memories, it's, in my opinion, unavoidable to talk about Freud. Uh, Conrad Lawrence, the, one of the, the uh, founding fathers of etology, right, got a Nobel, Nobel Prize for that. He, he said in the, in the 40s that it doesn't matter whether you like or you dislike Freud's theories. We have to come to terms with the observations he made. He was a, a deep observer of human behavior. And in particular, he was a very important uh, researcher of dreams. And many of the things that he said a hundred and so years ago happened to be testable and happened to be supported by empirical evidence. I'm going to show some of that today. Uh, in the interpretation of the dreams, of dreams, he says two things which can be interpreted as poetry, can be interpreted as non-science, because they sound uh, beautiful and at the same time sort of imprecise. First, he said dreams contain day residues, right? Uh, it's a way of saying that we, when we dream, we are reflecting what happens during the waking life. And the other one was dreams are the royal road to the unconscious, uh, this is a beautiful phrase, but if, unless you define unconscious with some operational definition, then uh, it's useless. And I, I, what I will try to do is, in the end, offer um, contemporary translations of those two statements based on the research that other people and, and myself have, have been doing. Um, the notion of the unconscious, though, is a very old notion. He didn't really invent it, but he framed it in a way that makes a lot of sense. Um, many people actually don't accept it. Many people believe that the totality of their minds is 
what they perceive as their minds. In other words, that their conscious mind is their mind, right? I don't know if you've seen this image here. If you have seen this image, please uh, don't say anything. But if you haven't, just watch it and make a mental description of the scene. Right, so you see a couple, they seem to be happy, maybe they're falling in love, they're having lunch. Is there something strange in this image? I mean, it's blinking. But besides the fact that it's blinking, is there anything weird? Is the bar moving? Right? Who hadn't seen it? Right? So this is a good one because it really almost always works. I like to show it because I think it's a very you know, uh, quick and dirty demonstration that a lot of what we perceive doesn't get to be conscious. The ball, the gorilla. The gorilla is unbelievable. Boom. <laughs> spoil, spoil. So there are many things like this that you can find that, that basically are saying, look, you are getting all the information in your retina, right? The, the, the photons are telling you where the bar is. So if, you, if I was measuring the activity of the cells, of the ganglion cells in the retina, I should be able to tell whether the bar is moving or not. So something happens further down the road, Right, and, and now we know it's between, I mean, this information will reach not just the retina, it will reach the thalamus, it will reach the primary visual cortex. But if it does not spread from the primary visual cortex to the rest of the visual cortex and to further regions, that's worked by Stanislas Dehn and, and others, it does not, not get to be conscious. So for something to be conscious, it needs to get beyond the, its own sensory modality. It has to recruit a more complex graph. Let's put it that way, okay? Uh, and there's a whole discussion. I mean, there are measures of complexity proposed, for example, by Tononi, which have to do with the entropy of this big graph and so on. And, and this, is a, this is an open point for discussion. Nobody has a very good, I mean, consciousness is, is still some up, 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 up for grabs. I mean, we don't know what it is exactly, right? But it's something very interesting. Uh, well, I mean... It depends. I mean, if you're a Nobel Prize like Francis Crick, then you can certainly do it, right? Or if you're a broken Brazilian scientist like we are here now with the Brazilian cuts in the scientific budget, you might as well do it. I mean, what the heck, right? But yes, I mean, if you're in Harvard or Yale, maybe you shouldn't. Okay. <laughs> Let me move away. Okay, we can go on. I just wanted to stop because it's blinking and it's... Uh, yeah, I'm about the blinking. In oh, fact, you want to go with okay? You do not see the the bar changing because the, because of of the people. If you take the people out, of course, you see. Immediately. Absolutely, of course, because your attention so is the focused here, on the people. The, yeah, defining what is attention, yeah. silence, and all these. Yeah, things. yeah. No, no. I, I was just trying to give a hint that when when Freud builds on the notion of the unconscious, people should not resist the notion that there is an unconscious. Okay. And we can talk about, we'll talk more about this later. Just trying to say, you know, let's accept this exists. Let's accept that a lot of what is available in my, uh, what von Uxkel called uh, the Unwelt, right? My part of the sensory world. Even that is still mostly what I expect to see. I tend to see what I expect to see. Um, so remember, so this is about the unconscious phrase, but then he said that dreams contain the residues. When you say this, when Freud says this, he didn't say that we learn during dreams or that we learn during sleep. But that was implied. Because if we learn during waking, and if dreams are about day residues, then we're probably learning on dream, during dreams as well. It's a corollary of the, of the statement. Uh, F Jung actually said that very clearly. He said that dreams prepare the dreamer for the following day. But again, in a very philosophical, you know, non-hard science way. It became hard science in 1924 when Jenkins and Dallenbaugh working in, in Illinois replicated the Ebbinghaus experiment on forgetting. Right? I showed you the, the forgetting curve. Right? And they did it with the same participants under two conditions. Learning the syllables and then going to sleep or learning the syllables, which is this case here, or learning the syllables and then going to another class. These are college students. And I like to make the joke that this proves that it's much better to sleep than going to classes because you can see that 
the, the sleep when they had sleep they were they could retain um, exactly that's that's my intention um, and it's interesting here because it's the same subject so you can see it's really different different curves right it's different curves this was interpreted yes yes this is very important I, not during not during not during well it really depends on the kind of uh, teacher you have right I mean <laughs> Some, some classes you better sleep during, right? Um, so this is an interesting finding that was not followed up until the end of the 60s. So science left it untouched for 40 years, okay? And then in the late 60s and early 70s, the Americans and the French started to compete to see who was going to own this field. Uh, actually, the French even rediscovered REM sleep. REM sleep was discovered in 1953 in... Illinois as well. Illinois has something about sleep. Um, and then Jouvet, Michel Jouvet in Lyon, discovered paradoxical sleep in cats later. And then it, there were many, it was years before they really agreed they were talking about the same thing. And still to this day, you go to France, you talk about paradoxical sleep, you don't talk about REM sleep. Um, these experiments basically showed that if you sleep deprive animals after training them on something, they do badly afterwards. So but that the sleep that follows the training is important. Um, however, there was a big controversy. The controversy, okay, so first of all, how do you interpret this? One interpretation is I acquire the memory, and if I stay awake, the memory suffers interference. It will be attacked by other memories, which will come on top of it. So if I go to sleep, I passively protect the memory. This is not wrong but it's very insufficient. Sleep is not just passively protecting stuff. Sleep is actively changing memories. And we'll talk a lot about that. So, the mem so this notion from the, from the 60s that memories have to be just protected against interference is, 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 you know, is, doesn't account for all the phenomenon. Uh, another issue during the, the 70s and 80s is that people... people some people were very skeptical about the specific effects, effects of sleep. They were thinking, no, you are stressing the animal. You sleep deprive the animal. Me ayudas? Gracias. Muchas gracias. You sleep deprive the animal, and then the animal is stressed. And then you test the animal, and the animal goes badly because the animal is stressed. That makes sense. And this debate went on and on, and people fought uh, so badly that some people left the field entirely. Uh, William Fishbein, who is now 80-something, he returned to the field five years ago because he said, I was sick of all these fights and now that you younger guys finish the fights, I can come back to the field. How was the fight solved? So, for during the 80s, this guy in, in Canada, uh, Carlisle Smith, he was publishing results like this one you can see here. He was training rats to navigate a, a Morris maze, basically a, a, a big uh, swimming pool with one hidden platform. So the animal has to locate the platform, and it's, so it's a spatial memory um, task. You see, during the, in the first day, the animals take, in average, 30 seconds to find the, the platform. Okay, here. And he has three groups of animals, animals that he's sleep-deprived one to four hours after the task, or five to eight hours, or nine to 12 hours. So he just made a sleep deprivation period after the training. When he comes back the next day and tests the animals, he sees that two groups learned. Two groups are finding the platform sooner, right? And one group did not learn at all. Actually, it's taking longer. So he used these kind of data to say these animals were sleep deprived for the same amount of hours, and therefore, it's not stress. It's the specific sleep that happened during this particular window. And that argument did not convince everybody. It was good, but not good enough. And then, in the year 2000, Bob Stickold in Harvard published a paper that became the, the game changer in the field. He trained people to look at the screen with lots of letters. For example, letters T. Lots of literal letters T with all orientations. And your task is to find the one letter L. Okay? So it's very hard in the beginning. Um, it's what we call perceptual learning. It's something that is happening uh, 
between the thalamus and the cortex and the early f- parts of the cortex, actually primary visual cortex is strongly involved, and people get better. So if you train during the first day, you you gain, get a little bit of improvement, almost nothing, but then the next day you're doing really well. And then the next day you get better, and then the next day you get better. Every, overnight, with one single training, you get better overnight. Ah, that's interesting. But what if you sleep deprive the person on the first night? So you don't let the person sleep here. Let the person sleep on the second and third nights, okay. So you get rid of the stress. The person has slept two nights fully, no problem. And then you test. And what you see is the performance is still low. So this is the experiment. I don't know why it took people decades to come up with this, but, but this is the experiment that really changed the, the, the conversation. Uh, there was a meeting in 2003 in Chicago. It's always Chicago. Uh, of the 50 years of the discovery of REM sleep, the rapid eye movement sleep, the sleep during which we dream. And in this meeting, they invited these two guys to debate with the other two diehards, which were one guy called Vertes and the other guy called Siegel. And they were people that were publishing reviews against sleep and memory all the time. And every time there was a finding, interesting finding in science or nature, they would be invited to make an an uh, anti-hypothesis comment. And so the four of them were debating. At some point, Stickel chose this these data and says, what part of P is smaller than 0.05 corrected for Bonferroni you don't get? And then Zigo got really angry and said, I will never come back to a meeting like this. And everybody, st- I, was in, I was there, I was in the audience. And then 200 people stood up and started to clap and say, please don't come back. And then these guys left and they didn't come back. So the entire field moved to other questions. Basically, what are the mechanisms underlying this, right? Uh, so me- the mechanistic aspect of this became much more important in the past 15 years because people stopped, mostly stopped uh, quarreling about uh, whether this exists or not. Uh, I have to say, both m- sleep phases, what are those m- sleep phases? The, the slow-wave sleep phase, which is, occurs in the first half of the night for humans, and the rapid eye movement sleep phase, which occurs in the second half of the night for humans. If you look in the rat, you will find... Uh, substates. If you look in the human, you will find substates. But you can roughly divide the, the, the sleep in two major situations. One in which the cells are oscillating slowly with large amplitude and basically getting to be depolarized and then re- hyperpolarized in up and down states. And this is a, sta- is, a, is a general state that does not lead to consciousness. If you have a lot of interruptions in, this, in the neuronal activity, like you have during anesthesia or you have during slow wave sleep, you cannot be conscious. Okay? It's, if you wake the person up, the person will say, will report a, a black screen. And the other state is a state in which the neurons are oscillating very fast at very high frequencies. Does, people call it the desynchronized state, but it, it's probably wrong, right? They're synchronized at higher frequencies. It looks desynchronized to the eye, but it's actually synchronized. If you measure, you can see local synchronicity at 30, 50, 70, 100, 200, and very local in time as well, okay? Uh, gamma, right, Sergio? It's all about gamma, right? The gamma frequencies. And that you will find during conscious waking when you're reasoning and paying attention, if you may be doing this now, but you also find it during rapid eye movement sleep, when you're dreaming. You find the same kind of signatures in the cortex. No, no, no. In slow wave sleep, yes. Yes, yes, that you got, like, wake a little bit and come down, wake a little bit and come down, yes. But during REM sleep, no. During REM sleep, you don't have up and down states, right? You have... Intermittent spiking, yeah. So, most of my work, I, I, I do many different things, but most of what I do is mechanisms related to this. I mean, I work in rats, in other animal models, in humans as well. What is happening in the brain that can explain this? Um, and it's very useful, if you want to tackle this question, to go back to, to Donald Hebb. Um, he, he was already mentioned in the morning. Uh, I, I like to tell my students that if... if Santiago Ramon y Cajal is Moses, then Donald Hebb is Jesus Christ. You know? He's, he came with a theory that still to this day is giving us uh, food for thought. We're still testing ideas like, for example, assemblies, which were uh, a topic of the morning, 
uh, cell assemblies is something that we are barely learning how to measure, right? We, we recently we learned how to actually detect them in a in a in a in a sensible way. Uh, and then there are other things of his theory, like phase sequences, which are like if assemblies are letters, then phase sequences are words. Uh, and these are things that pe you know people barely studied so far. So and 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 but in this book, most people talk about the book because of the notion of the Hebbian synapse, right? The notion that in order to strengthen a connection, you need concurrent inputs and you need synchronous inputs. So multiple neurons converging on one neuron synchronously. Uh, we even have now a molecular counterpart for that. There is a particular channel called the NMDA channel that implements the Hebbian principle because it only opens if, if you have concurrent synchronous inputs. There's a magnesium that blocks this channel and, and the cell has to be depolarized for a long period of time so that the magnesium is expelled and then calcium can permeate the channel. So, so I would say this is the sort of theory that really found you know, very good translation in biology. And it's still predicting news. There are things that to be tested there. And one thing that he said early on in the book is that for memories to be acquired, we need a dual uh, stage process. Two things need to happen which are separate, okay? After an, an, a, a, an interesting event occurs. So an interesting event is there. There's something new for you to learn. How can you learn it? Heb said, first, you need to reverberate this information. You need to, with the brain that you have, with the molecules that you have, with the proteins that you have right now, you need to be able to get impressed by this event and keep this impression alive. He was very much influenced by uh, a student of Santiago Ramón y Cajal called Lorente de No. Lorente de No was working at the time at the Rockefeller University, was interested in reverberatory circuits. He was st studying neurons, chains of neurons that, that make a loop. And he was saying, well, this is probably how we store memories because once you start, then you keep the memory alive there. Okay, and this is interesting. But it's, it's, of course, not a solution, right? Imagine that you had to, rem to keep alive all the memories that you have in order not to lose them. For example, can you please think of the name of your first pet, if you had one? Okay. Did you? Okay. Were you thinking about this a minute ago? You weren't, right? So where was this memory? This memory was not reverberating. It was not active. It was inactive. It was latent. So he said, for memories to be formed, at some point, they need to stop reverberation and they need to lead to structural change or morphological change or what we call now synaptic plasticity or neuronal plasticity in a more general manner. Right? So how do you store the, the name of your first pet? You store it as a circuit of neurons that have a particular morphological relationship to each other, right? They change their spines, right? They prune some, they strengthen others, and that is what we call the memory, right? Now, it's not always the same neurons. I mean, the Sinfire theory is a beautiful theory, but it, it really requires a level of precision that you don't find in electrophysiology. It's a more fuzzy system, apparently, right? You don't need to engage the same neurons, but you need to engage neurons from the same set of neurons. It costs energy to keep it on. Uh, it, you have the structural change and... The so the structural no change is, is an economical way to store the memory because it costs a lot, a lot of energy to, to produce it, right? You need, to, you need protein synthesis, you need to... Actin needs to be mobilized, and you have the amper receptors. We'll talk about it later. But once you do it, then you have it, right? I mean, the memories that are most robust are the old ones. If you hit your head, you will remember everything from last month, but you will not rem forget... You will forget the last month, but you will not forget your childhood, right? So, so the, the second part here is very robust. It can last a century, right? To talk to old people that are lucid, talk to your grand-grandfather, right? The person that is turning 100, and they will tell stories about their the childhood in detail, right? But they cannot remember two weeks ago. And, and this has to do, and, and we'll talk about, about this later, that these molecular changes, they are like compound interest. You know, you have these things adding up over time. We'll talk about it next.
time, how long it take to recover a... To rec you mean to recall it, to retrieve it? Yeah. Well, it's, it's very, uh, you know, milliseconds. I mean, hundreds of milliseconds. If I ask you what is the name of your first uh, girlfriend? Two seconds? <laughs> So that uh, will this model uh, hold for all, all memory types, or do you think that it's specific to? I think this model is general. Yeah. I think this model is general because it really requires things that are general, like membrane potentials and, and say, uh, second messengers. Uh, so I think this probably applies to the basal ganglia, and there's some evidence of that actually between the cerebellum and the basal ganglia. Yes, Serge. Um, or, or is this a, is a so he borrowed the term from Lorente de Nord, who was talking about a, a loop. And the reverberation was something that you, is something you can observe in a loop in vitro. Like you Edelman can, said, yeah. the hand tree. Yes, but in, in, the, in the Hebbian sense, it's a more general word because he's, he knows that you can have the reverberation of a trace without necessarily having an anatomical loop. It doesn't have to be that simple, right? Maybe you don't have the loop, but you have a, but the, the set of neurons that is firing now is so committed to the next set of neurons, it's so coordinated with the next set of neurons, and this is related to the Sinfire chain theory, that basically every time you start the process, you flow through the same path. I mean, it happens to all of us all the time. When you get a, a song on FM radio uh, that does not leave your mind for days and you don't even like the song, right? This happens all the time. Every time you relax a little bit, boom, this little song comes up. Um, but this is a process that spends a lot of energy. The cells have to fire more, right? The neurons need to synchronize. And, of course, it's a very expensive way of storing memories. Mm -hmm. imagine, if you had to, imagine if you had to keep in your mind everything you ate for breakfast in the past 20 years. You'd be a perfect idiot, right? You could not even talk to people because you would have this entire repertoire of things in your mind all the time. It's like uh, uh, the Borges' story, Funes el Memorioso, the, the guy that could not re forget. If you cannot forget, you cannot think, right? Because you cannot exclude all the things that don't matter. Um, a lot of what sleep does is to forget, is to promote forgetting. We'll, we'll talk more about this in the next slides. Now, if you want to study the first part, how do you go about that? So you need to, you need to find a way to to observe the activity of the neurons. You can do it in many different ways. One way is to implant electrodes in the brain. This is what we do in the lab. Uh, you anesthetize the animal, put electrodes in different parts of the brain, close the animal with dental acrylic, and after about a week, the animal is, if you did a good surgery, the animal will be fine, and you'll be able to record the activity of hundreds of neurons, potentially thousands of neurons, uh, as the animal is doing interesting behavior, okay, and this can last for months. Uh, this is a screen that we open at the, in the computer. Where, where is it? So if I, if I open the screen at the, of my computer, I see little boxes here. Every little box here is one of those electrodes. If I click here, I see it larger, in a larger format. And then I can use a variety of techniques for example, principal component analysis to say that the green potentials are probably a one neuron and the yellow potentials are probably another neuron. It's different from an intracellular recording, right? If I, were, if I had an electrode inside the neuron, I would know for sure this is a neuron and, and it's talking to, you know, X number of neurons. But this is not the case. It's an, what I'm having here is an extracellular recording. It would be equivalent to holding this microphone here And I would say, well, I think there are many neurons here, but I can detect two because they're closer. The amplitude is larger. No, it's always the same problem unless you have a tetrode, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so unless you have intracellular recording, you are talking about a putative neuron. So depending on the problem you have, this may not be enough. Right? This may not be good enough. And depending on the problem you have, this might be more than enough. What is the way that you have to gain when you have something like this? Uh, here, what we have to gain is we can record many neurons at the same time. If I had intracellular recordings, I would have a lot of information about this particular neuron. 
but this is not it currently we cannot have both things hmm? you have to choose one way or another um, this is a image of a, a brain section from which we remove the electrodes after weeks of recordings and it's basically here to convince you that you can do this without completely destroying the tissue so you can see the tracks of the, near, of the electrodes here in the somatosensory cortex, in the visual cortex, or in the CA1 field of the hippocampus. Um, one experiment that I've been doing over and over again is the novel object experience. This is an interesting task because you don't need to train the animals to do that. The animals are naturally, if they are not stressed, they're naturally inclined to explore novel things. Um, and, and it's interesting because despite the lack of behavioral control, you can measure learning every single time you do it. How? You re-expose the animals to some of the same objects and to some new objects. And they clearly prefer the new objects. So they certainly know the difference. Mm -hmm. Why is this uh, interesting? Because it's uh, halfway between the lab and nature. Right? You're using a very natural instinct that the animal has, but you're doing it in a, in a lab, you're filming everything, you know, using infrared light, so they have to use the whiskers because they cannot see the objects, and so on. When we do that, when we did that, we observed very interesting and actually unexpected behavior of the neurons. You see here the activity of 12 neurons in the hippocampus in the CA1 field, 12 neurons in the somatosensory cortex, in the region that receives information from the whiskers in the barrel field, and 12 neurons in the visual, primary visual cortex. This is two hours that preceded the experience with the contact with the objects, so it's a negative control period. And this is the, these are the three hours that came after the, the, the encounter with the objects, which I put here as a red bar because this is a whole story which I will not have time to describe today. But what happens to the neurons after you remove the objects? And one thing I did here is that I removed, I deleted all the periods during which the animal was awake. I only let you see here when the animal is asleep. Okay? The animal is in slow wave sleep in particular. The boundaries of the states are down here. You can see all the concatenated episodes here. What you, we see is that when you look at the firing rates of the neurons, neither the hippocampus nor the visual cortex, this was done in the dark with infrared light, show a lasting change of firing rates. The rates don't change for, for beyond a few minutes in the hippocampus. In the very beginning, they do change in the hippocampus here in the first minutes, but then they come back to something that is roughly the same as before. The same thing for the visual cortex. However, for the somatosensory cortex, the cortex that receives information from the whiskers, you see a long-lasting persistent change in firing rates during sleep. So the animal is not moving around. The animal is asleep. Why is this interesting? Well, to our knowledge, this is the first time that we can observe with electrophysiology something that persists in the cortex for hours, but not in the hippocampus. And why is this relevant? Because of the patient AGM, because of this notion that memories become corticalized over time. Cortex. Um, the experiment for the visual cortex using um, visual cues. Say it again. You, yeah, as far as uh, I understood, you used somatosensory cues. Sensory cues. Se somatosensory tactile so stimulation. With tactile stimulation. And then you see a um, clear change in um, the somatosensory cortex and not the primary visual cortex, yes. correct? Yes. Have you done the opposite? So I did it in one animal. But this should be very important. And, and it worked. I did it in one animal. It's a little bit more complicated because you don't know whether the, a rat is seeing or not seeing, right? You, it's very easy to tell whether the animal is exploring an, an, an object with the whiskers. I can film the animal and I can show that the animal was in contact with the object. If the rat is sitting there and I'm showing a movie, I've done this experiment. Actually, in Nivaldo's paper in, PNA, in PNAS, I published a figure that, show, that shows what happens in the visual cortex during the tactile uh, uh, exploration. It gets activated by tactile stimulus, probably. Okay? But I also did it with a movie. And when you do it with a movie, you see an increase in activity in V1. 
But you don't know whether the enemy was watching the movie, whether the enemy was not watching the movie. It's, it, it's more complicated for, for, the rat, for, for rat work. For monkeys, you, can, you know for sure whether the enemy was watching or not. Uh, I keep asking you to let your monkeys sleep because I think this is a very beautiful question that we should tackle together. Yes. <laughs> and then you change subject, right? Don't want my animals sleeping in my chair. That's what he told me. He spends all the time telling the, the animals not to sleep in the chair. But you have to embrace the natural behavior. So we started to believe that, that sleep corticalizes memories. And how? By keeping the cortex doing stuff while the hippocampus is not doing stuff. Okay, and I'm going to show you other examples of that. Now, so far I showed you basically electrophysiological data and, ba and very simple uh, basic data, firing rates, right? Normalized firing rates. But that's only, uh, it only pertains to the first part of the equation, which is this neuronal reverberation part, right? Can, what can we say about the second part, which is the structural change part? For that, if you want to do it in a contemporary manner, one way, at least, is to look at the molecular markers involved, right? One, the, the molecular players of this. This is a, a slide that is put there in order to make everybody leave. No, this, don't worry about the slides. Let's try to understand the, the, the general feeling of this thing here. This is a pre-synaptic terminal, so it's the tip of the axon talking to a postsynaptic terminal in the dendrite. Okay, and it's releasing, this, the cell here is releasing glutamate. Glutamate is a neurotransmitter that will bind to different receptors here. In the beginning, these receptors called AMPA receptors will be open and will permeate sodium. And this will depolarize the, the terminal. If this depolarization is strong enough, then this NMDA receptor that I mentioned before will be unplugged from the magnesium that sits inside and will allow calcium to get in. And really, this is the coin for plasticity. It's the entry of calcium above a certain threshold that will trigger a series of events that you can think of as a, as a, as a, as a long series of dominoes, one uh, making the other one fall, okay? One making the next one fall. So as the calcium gets in, it activates a series of proteins, which we call kinases. These are proteins that, are, that give a phosphate to another protein. So you're basically transferring information from one to the next protein by the means of, of, of a phosphate group. Okay? In particular, one called calcium calmodulin kinase, which I will talk about later. Please just see that it's in the very early step here. But then other later steps involve eventually the phosphorylation of a, a, a molecule called CREB. And this molecule will go into the nucleus. So this happened in milliseconds. This happened in one second, two seconds. And this is happening in five minutes. Five minutes after the stimulus, if you learn something new today, five minutes afterwards, millions of your neurons will show this kind of response here, which is basically a protein getting into the nucleus. What is this protein doing in the nucleus? It's promoting the transcription of other genes. This is super, super important for the long-term effects. Why? You have, you know, tons of genes, but most of them are not being used. You're not using most of your genes in any single cell. What makes one cell one thing and another cell another thing is the subsets, different subsets of genes being used, right? What this crab, phosphorylated crab is doing is to change the subset of genes that are being transcribed. Is that clear to everybody? Activated. Let's call it activated. Okay? Basically, you say, from this DNA, I want to make RNA. And from the RNA, you make the protein. Okay? Serge. Well, this particular cascade is related to plasticity. So it's related. Typically, you have plasticity when you have some mismatch in the expectation. So novelty. Okay? Novelty, but I think it's a very, it's too general. I mean, we, this is, these are mechanisms that became clear in the aplysia, in the mollusk, right? And they're true in the rat, in the mouse, and they're true for us. But, of course, for every single specific behavior, we have to talk, be, talk specifics, right? This is a gen, general mechanism, which is true for most cells. Or for, all cells have these genes to, to, for all those different proteins. Whether they use them or not, is a, it may be a particular story. Some of this reaction 
do not happen in a timely fashion. It means not five seconds, but let's say after 60 seconds. No, excellent question. Let's say if I block protein synthesis, if I block it down here, if I stop it here, what happens to the memories? They don't get to be long-lasting. This is actually a finding from the early 60s. So transmitting information in a timely fashion is crucial. Crucial, crucial. Right? If you disrupt the information in the millisecond range here, you destroy it. If you distru- disturb it in the, in the, for minutes here, down here, you also destroy it. Okay? So, so this entire process here is necessary. And at some point, these genes that got activated will lead to proteins which will now do things. The proteins will do things. The, 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 the genes don't do anything themselves, right? But the proteins, they get to do things in the cell. And there are two main kinds of proteins. Some proteins we call effectors. For example, the protein ARC, which I I may show later something on this. The effectors are proteins that do things themselves. So the ARC protein, the ARC protein will go to the terminal and will promote a change in the terminal that will change the shape of the connection and will change the strength of the connection will mobilize, for example, AMPA receptors, put them together with the CAM kinase 2 complex for, for calcium-dependent phosphorylation, and will bring actin, which is this, basically the, 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 the cytoskeleton will change. So the cell will change the shape so that you can remember the name of the pet that you first had, and, but you don't have to do it all the time. Because now you have it written in the new pattern of connections that can be activated at any time. Is that clear? Okay, but there's another kind of genes that do not do anything themselves in the synapse. What they do is they go, the protein goes back in the nucleus. It's a regulator. It goes back in the nucleus, like ZIF-268, and it will promote the activation of hundreds of genes. So you activate one gene, and this gene activates 300 genes. So five minutes after the stimulation, you have these guys showing up. And six hours later, you have everybody that this guy activates showing up. And then 12 hours later, and then six days later, and then, and so on. Okay, so it becomes a really, it's what we call the amplification of the signal at the molecular level. You started with calcium, and now you have 300 genes. And of course, you, you know, 300 genes, I mean, you're really changing the entire cell. Okay? In particular, ZIF-268 promotes the activation or transcription of a gene called synapsin. This is the most, it codes for the most abundant protein of the synapse. It's a a protein necessary for the docking and fusing of the vesicles so that you can release neurotransmitters. Okay? So, what is interesting is that both genes, if you knock them down, if you remove them, if you delete them from from the animal, it will, it will not preclude the animals from learning. The animals will still learn, but it will be short-lived. So they will learn and they will forget. You go the next day, no learning. You go a few minutes later, learning. So they cannot retain the information. Okay? Many years ago when I was doing my PhD, I decided to ask whether this particular gene here was upregulated, was activated during sleep. I said, well, if sleep is important for learning, this gene should be activated. Because in the late 90s, this is when we discovered about these genes. Sorry, in the late 80s. And I did my PhD in the mid-90s. So I said, let's investigate the levels of this gene in animals that are sleeping. But let's compare animals that were sleeping and never left the home cage to animals that were exposed to a rat's Disneyland. Why? Because I wanted to see what is the difference of the previous experience. If the animal has nothing new to learn, would it make sense to activate plasticity? Probably not. How do you do this then in practice? Well, this, if I'm studying ZIF-268, this is a gene whose mRNA, the, the, the product of the activation of the gene, let's put it that way, reaches a peak at 30 minutes after the stimulus. Okay? So if I want to study the expression of the gene associated to the waking phase or to the slow wave sleep phase or to the rapid eye movement sleep phase, I need to let the animal enter one of these states up to a criterion, say five minutes of slow wave sleep. 
And then I wake the animals up and I let them stay awake for 30 minutes. Why? Because I want them to have the same experience across groups so that the only thing that is different is the reference state that occurred 30 minutes before I killed the animal. So at, exactly at 30 minutes I go there, I kill the animal, remove the brain, fro- freeze the brain, cuts the brain, and then throw a radioactive RNA probe, basically a strand of RNA that is complementary to the RNA that I want to tackle, right? If I have an RNA that is complementary, it will just bind there and it's radioactive. I can detect the presence of the RNA. This is called in situ hybridization. When you do that, what do you find? In the boring, in in the boredom group, the animals that never left the home cage, I start with very strong expression in the cortex and hippocampus during waking, but that expression decreases. The blue and black means no expression, right? And and yellow and red means strong expression. And it decreases strongly. So you would say in this group of animals, there is plasticity here, but no plasticity here. Let's put if you in a simple manner. However, in the animals that were exposed to novelty, you start with high levels, they come down, and then they come up again during REM sleep. Ten minutes, perfect. (laughs) <laughs> but I started late, right? No es cierto, Ricardo. Okay. Fifteen. Okay. So maybe if so okay. Did you stop the, the, the clock? Okay. <laughs> so, it, you know, this is interesting because it's is saying, depending on your previous waking experience, what you express during sleep will change. Okay? And it's suggesting that novelty is triggering a plasticity phenomenon during REM sleep hours afterwards. Okay? In, in this particular case, three hours between one thing and the other, and this involves both hippocampus and cortex. We said, well, let's follow this idea. One of the criticisms that I got was that the experience was too general, too broad. In slow wave sleep is this state in which the oscillations are very slow, and and that is a stop signal for transcription. I mean, why? Maybe because you don't need you need sustained spiking. I don't know. I mean, but it's very consistent. So we decided to do something a little reductionistic. Let's not expose the animals to novel objects. Let's induce what we were saying in the morning, long-term potentiation, LTP. LTP is, is an artificial kind of memory that you can promote with electrical stimulation. This was discovered in 1973, and in the past 15 years, people sort of agreed that this is the physiological basis of, of memories, right? That the memories actually occurred through something like LTP. So it's a good model of memory. Basically, what I did was to put electrodes to stimulate the perfect path, which is the, one of the entry doors to the hippocampus, and record in the dente gyrus. You start with, with uh, responses that are small, and you do high-frequency stimulation, and then the responses increase. I'm not going to go into the detail, the slope, the spike. I mean, I don't have a lot of time, but believe me, that you can measure the increase of the response for hours. And you say, okay, so now I have LTP, so that means I can do it in the hippocampus and then see what happens in the entorhinal cortex, in the other parts of the cortex, in the amygdala. I have a certain anatomical path to follow. So what can I learn from that? And of course I need to do it with a, with a control, a negative control in the brain, which means I do it in one hemisphere and I don't do it in the other hemisphere. So I can induce LTP in one hemisphere in black while the other hemisphere does not show the effects if I don't give any stimulation or if I give low-frequency stimulation. So I have one hemisphere that was stimulated for LTP and the other one is a control. I'm going to give you a a summary, a qualitative summary, and then I go into the group data for you to understand the the process. This is a qualitative summary of the data. At 9 a.m., the animals were awake and we induced LTP in one hemisphere, not in the other. At 9.30, the animal is still awake. I see expression of the gene in one hippocampus in the dente gyrus, exactly where it should be because it's one synapse away from the stimulus, and I don't see anything in the other hippocampus. So that that part is good. I, I was able to write a memory to the hippocampus and not to the other hippocampus. 
If I let the animals uh, stay awake and only sleep at noon, so hours afterwards, I see no expression in the hippocampus anymore. It's gone from the hippocampus. But it's present in the entorhinal cortex and, and in general in the temporal cortex near the hippocampus in the amygdala. A little bit leaks to the other side, but it's not significant. When we measure the, the, across the group, the other side is not significant. Of course, you have commissures linking the two sides. And if you let the animals go through a second REM sleep episode, not just one, but two, you still have no change in the hippocampus, but you now have a very strongly lateralized expression, and it goes further to the somatosensory and motor cortices. So here I'm one synapse away from the stimulus, here I'm three, four, here I'm five, six, and so on. So this is really suggesting that, that sleep is pushing memory traces away from the hippocampus. Okay? Uh, I'm going to show you the same experiments, but the group data. I'm going to sh uh, uh, show you colors that represent the mean value for the expression of the gene. And I'm going to show you successive states. Okay, so say waking before stimulation and then with stimulation, and then waking with stimulation, and then the next hour, and then sleep, and then so on. Uh, and, and that's going to be a, following this circuit here, the dentate gyres, the CA fields, the entorhinal cortex, the auditory cortex. This is basically an anatomical circuit to follow. Okay? What we found is in the very beginning, you stimulate and only the dentate gyre shows expression here. You see five times more than, than the previous state. And everything else is red or black, which means no expression. When the animal goes into what I call early wake, so that's a few, you know, one hour after the stimulation, you don't see expression in the dentate gyres anymore, but you see expression here in the, in the middle part of the circuit. Then when the animal goes into slow sleep, reduction. As I said before, it's a stop signal, no expression. And then REM sleep, boom, comes up again. And then wake, and then it progresses, goes to the further parts of the, of the circuit. Slow sleep, again, stop signal. And then REM sleep comes back again. The way we interpret this is three waves of hippocampal fugal expression. So expression of the gene that is escaping the hippocampus. In the beginning, you start in the dentate gyres and it progresses to the middle parts of the circuit. Stops. When it starts again, it starts in the middle and goes to the end parts. Stops. And then starts in the middle and getting to the end and probably further down. Okay? If this is true, could it be that the hippocampus is playing any role. Because if the memories are being corticalized, you would imagine the hippocampus is instructing the process because the hippocampus has information. So we said, what would happen to the expression of the gene in this part of the circuit here if I blocked this part of the circuit here? Would I be able to affect it? So we, for this experiment, we did a slight modification. We induced LTP in both hemispheres. Okay, Both hemispheres received LTP. But I had cannulas, I had tubes going to the hippocampus to inject drugs. And I injected one of the, hip, of, the, of the sides with saline, with water and salt, and the other with a sodium channel blocker, tetracaine, li like lidocaine, okay, anesthetic. When you do that, you block the activity of the hippocampus almost immediately. This is a spectrogram of the activity. You see a lot of slow wave sleep, a lot of low frequencies. As soon as I start having a little bit of 7 hertz here, which is the REM sleep theta rhythm. I inject the drug and boom, I abolish the, the signal. I don't have activity of the hippocampus for the rest of the experiment. When we did that, we found that the control side sh showed very nice expression of the gene, but the stimulated side did not, which means that the cortical expression of the gene does depend on what's happening in the hippocampus. The hippocampus is somehow instructing or permitting or allowing the process. Now, the devil's advocate would say, well, how do you know that the drug that you injected did not reach the ventriculum and, and diffused and then you know, got some non-specific effect in the cortex? So we repeated the same experiment during waking. Same situation, except the animal was in waking, okay, and not in sleep. And when we do that, we do not see this reduction here. How do we interpret this? During waking, this expression here is governed by the thalamocortical circuits. The thalamus is receiving sensory information, sent it to the cortex, and driving gene expression. When you're asleep, the thalamus is not doing that, 
And then the hippocampus takes control. And then if you block the hippocampus, you, you lose the cortical expression. Okay, so the hippocampus is involved. Then we said, let's go back to the naturalistic condition with the objects, with the, with the novel objects, but let's allow the animal to sleep freely for four hours, in average 28 episodes of sleep. Would, you, would I also see this corticalization in this natural situation, not the artificial paradigm, but a more natural one? And the answer is yes. For the gene ARC and for the gene ZIF, the two genes that I showed you, I see a lot of activation in the cortex in the REM sleep hours after and nothing in the hippocampus. Same thing for ZIF. You say, oh, but this seems to be activated, but it's not different from the negative control. Okay? So in fact, I do see the same thing in the, na in the natural condition. The cortex is getting the expression, not the hippocampus. Notice that it's not the entire cortex. It's the supragranular and infragranular layers. You don't get activity in, the, in layer 4, which receives the thalamic inputs. People in the field believe that this is probably because you don't want to have plasticity in the input layer, right? You don't want to change the input layer. You want to change other layers for computation, but not the, the one that receives the thalamic input. Okay, so this is another set of experiments that connects what's happening during sleep, and in particular to the transition into REM sleep and uh, 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 memory corticalization. Um, when we, I have five minutes, two minutes, zero, over. Cabo? Thank you very much. No, no, at four I stop. At four I stop. At four I stop. At four I stop. Is that okay? Okay, okay, four o'clock is good. Four o'clock is good. So, uh, these ideas that I'm... Uh, no, but I want, you, I want you to see the next ones. <laughs> uh, one, one thing that happened, so when I started having these results in the beginning, people that were dominating the field, namely Tononi and Cirelli, uh, Giulio Tononi and, and Chiara Cirelli in, in Madison, back in the 90s. They did not believe it. They said, no, we don't have these results, we have different results. And as a consequence, uh, 
for many, many years they did not cite neither my work nor the work of other people like in Marcus Frank in Penn State or Subi Maldat in Johns Hopkins. Basically, we started having a, a, like a parallel field that was finding a, a signal, uh, evidence of LTP during sleep. And they were not finding that evidence. Recently, in 2014, uh, this group published a, a neuron review in which they cited the entire field that they had been not citing. They acknowledged the existence of this, of this evidence. But they said, maybe it doesn't mean what you think it means. Maybe these molecules do, are not good, good uh, signals of LTP, good, good uh, indicators of LTP. Why? Because they're, you know, ZIF is regulating 300 genes. I mean, this is a complex response. You cannot say this is LTP. And that's a fair argument. So we decided many years ago, actually, to focus on a molecule which people don't argue about the role in LTP, which is exactly CAM kinase 2, right? This is a, an enzyme that is, is sitting next to the, to the channels in the submembranic space. And this enzyme has autocatalytic properties. So once it's phosphorylated, it will phosphorylate itself. So it's a little unit of memory. Once it gets to be activated, it will remain activated for a long time. Uh, certainly the second case. The first case, uh, I, th I think people believe yes, but I'm not totally sure it's a, it's a finished job. Um, and this happens very fast. This happens, uh, Lisman has been measuring this uh, extensively, and the, the notion is that two seconds after stimulation, you reach the maximum. Two seconds. Okay, not half an hour, but two seconds. And everybody agrees that this is related to LTP. If you knock this mo molecule down, the animal cannot learn. Okay? It's, uh, so this is very critical for learning. So we decided to look at the levels of this, of this molecule in a phosphorylated manner, in the non-phosphorylated manner. And then basically we re repeated the same sort of behavioral paradigm. These are the people that did the, 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 the bench work. Uh, she was a postdoc. Katja was a postdoc at the time. Vinicius too, and Ani is currently a PhD student. And basically the same paradigm with objects, without objects, a control, and a non-exposed control. The only difference is that when the animals reached the, the state of interest, we killed them immediately. We, can, we, we did not wait anything. We just killed the animals right away, removed the brains, and so on. And we looked for the phosphorylation levels of chem kinase 2 alpha and ZIF-268. Why ZIF-268? Well, I told you this, the RNA of ZIF peaks 30 minutes after the stimulus. If I'm killing the animal immediately and I'm looking for the protein, I should not see any change, right? If the protein takes hours to change, it cannot change in two seconds. So in this case, ZIF is a negative control, not a positive control, right? Is that clear for everybody? What? Yeah? Okay. I also looked for the levels of actin, Okay, and total CAM kinase 2, because the CAM kinase 2 is there, but what matters for, for me, if I want to say it's LTP, I need to get the phosphorylated form. And, and I would say at the time there were three possible hypotheses. The, the dominant hypothesis is, is the so-called homeostasis hypothesis, which says that you should have high levels that then drop during sleep. That's the Tonori and Cirelli model, forgetting during sleep. You decrease LTP during sleep. Okay? Our model is the so-called embossing hypothesis by which you decrease and then you increase during REM sleep. Okay? And the new hypothesis, which is, you know, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter which state the animal is in. The level should be so somewhat constant. What we found was the following. For ZIF, for actin, and for chem kinase 2, for three proteins that should not be changed because there was no time for change, we saw basically stable levels. There was no significant change, and the curvatures here are very uh, mild. Okay? But for the phosphorylated version of the protein, we saw in the exposed group the U-shape. We saw a decrease in, in slow sleep and the increase in REM sleep, and not for the controls which were not exposed. So now we have a molecule that is clearly identified, identified with LTP, and which is upregulated during REM sleep when the animal is exposed. So now 
we move to a next level because now we're not discussing whether this is LTP or not. We're saying what happens when you have LTP in the brain during sleep? What is the consequence of that? Um, but then before we got to the modeling part, which I think is why you wanted to give me 40 minutes more, uh, there's one more thing that I want to, one more empirical data that I want to bring to the model, which is when exactly is this happening? Okay, what is the neuronal the neural correlate of this phosphorylation. And we had many reasons to believe that a particular oscillation, to get to Sergio's question, a particular oscillation that occurs in the transition between slow wave and REM could be proportional to this phosphorylation. And this oscillation is the cortical spindle. There's plenty of evidence in the past 20 years that when you go to sleep, if you learn a lot, if you, if you learned a lot during waking, when you go to sleep, you have a lot of cortical spindles. And the amount of cortical spindles that you show will be proportional to the learning you show on the next day. These spindles, they look like this. Okay, this is, a, this is the, the, the signal and this is the filtered signal. Okay, this is the raw data. And you can see spindles during slow wave sleep and you can see spindles in the transition to REM sleep. Like here, you have a very long spindle. We do. We plot uh, the, the frequencies that we can, the potency. Well, we plot the power ratios of particular frequencies to generate what we call state maps. Okay. Basically, this allows you to track the state of the animal based on the LFP, based on the on the on the brain waves. Okay. So when the animal is awake, every data point co corresponds to one second here. So the animals occupy this red region here. This is an animal that is awake. The animal goes here. This is slow wave sleep. Okay? And then it goes into intermediate sleep and then wakes up because it was never allowed to go to REM in this group. But here it was allowed to go to REM and how it goes to REM? It goes here. It goes from slow wave sleep to REM which is the red territory. Okay? What we marked here, the circles are exactly the spindles. The diameter of the, of the circle is the duration of the spindle. Okay, so you have spindles in, during slow sleep, you have spindles during the transition to REM sleep. When you get to REM sleep, you don't have spindles anymore. So spindles are a, a trademark of this transition from slow wave to REM. By the way, they are also a trademark of the transition into sleep. When you fall into sleep, you have a lot of spindles in the first minutes of your sleep. Okay, so we found, to make it short, that there was, in the slow wave group, the group that never went to REM sleep, they got a lot of spindles, but the spindle did not correlate with the, ph the phosphorylation of the kinase. There was no correlation. But when we looked into the REM group, and we got all the spindles that occurred there, both the spindles in blue, which are the slow wave, and the spindles in the magenta, which are the, the transition, when we sum them all, we get a very nice correlation with the phosphorylation levels. So we have a, a, a R square of 0.48, right? So 48% of the variance explained of the variance of the, of the phosphorylation levels of the kinase explained by the presence of spindles in, during the transition. The cortical spindle is an oscillation that occurs in the cortex during the transition to sleep and again during the transition from slow wave sleep to REM sleep. Okay, so what this is telling me is that there's something happening during this transition which is roughly proportional to the levels of phosphorylation of the kinase. So this is a link between electrophysiology and molecular biology. It's saying if I have these oscillations, then I can predict I'm going to have a lot of phosphorylation of this protein. Okay, and for me what is interesting here is this notion that you need the full transition. You, it, it's not enough to have spindles. You need to have spindles plus go into REM sleep, okay? Otherwise, you would have a result here, which you don't. Okay, then we decided to model that. Uh, and that was the PhD work of Wilfredo Blanco. Um, actually, he went to Ribeirão Preto at some point. The paper has acknowledgments to uh, uh, both uh, Hockey and Ozami, who were here, and also to Guillermo. Uh, this was many years in the making, actually. Uh, what we decided to do was to... First, we started with a very simple um, network. Then later, we evolved to, to a more complicated network. But basically, to get a network of artificial neurons, which in this case was, was a network of excitatory neurons all connected to each other like a Boltzmann machine, 
like a hop field uh, uh, network, but evolving over time. Not just one training of the network, but actually training the network over and over again, making a movie of that, right? And having two sorts of inputs. First, the internal inputs, basically the connections among the neurons. And second, the external inputs, which came from spikes from the brain of a rat. So we basically plugged the network on a, a train of spikes, on actually many, many spikes uh, from many neurons, say 30 neurons, 40 neurons, as the animal was traversing waking, slow wave, and REM. So we're basically looking for the evolution of the network as the animal traverses those cycles. And then we modeled LTP or not LTP in this, okay? For those that like those things, <laughs> this is what we did, okay? Um, every, so if I had 40 neurons in my rat, then I model a network with 40 artificial neurons that receive those inputs, right? If I had 20 neurons, then I, I model a, a smaller network. And this is a Hebbian uh, it follows Hebbian rules, so we need concurrent inputs. If, if a presynaptic neuron fires and then a postsynaptic neuron fires, you give a prize to that. If the postsynaptic fires without the presynaptic, you give a penalty for that, okay? Instantaneously. Um, what else is important to say about this? We started the networks with a uniform distribution of weights, so we always started with this, you know, I don't want to use the word random anymore because I know it's a very bad word to use. So, uh, we started with this uh, uniform distribution of weights. Um, <laughs> so just to give you an idea that the states differ very much in terms of the activity that the system shows. So, for example, the, if you measure rates, okay, in the hippocampus in particular, you see high rates in waking, low rates in slow wave, and then they come up again during REM sleep and say, hmm, that's a U. Could that be determining the, the pattern that you observe? But then if you look at the, at the correlations, you have a very different picture. You have very strong correlations during waking. They decrease during slow wave sleep. And of course, that depends on the bin that you choose, right? It depends strongly on the, the bin that you choose. But then in REM sleep, the correlations really drop. So REM sleep would be, from this point of view, very noisy. Okay? You have high firing rates, but the neurons are not synchronized. And what is the effect of that on, on the pattern? Um, we started playing with Poisson data, and then we moved to real data. Yeah. Here? This is the mean uh, Pearson correlation. Yes. Time, uh, 10 to the minus 2. Yes. These correlations are very, very small. These correlations are very, very small. When people go into science and nature saying that they found replay during sleep, they're talking about the correlation of 0.2. Yes. 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 But small. So now you get this network, and you give as in external inputs, not real data, but just data that has the same mean firing rates of the real data, but that has no structure, that is, has a Poisson structure, okay? What you find, so you start with a uniform distribution of weights, and you very quickly converge to a, to a stable endpoint weight, okay? So you basically erase the memory. If you call this uniform distribution in the beginning a memory, the memory is erased very fast, and it, this erasure depends on the firing rate of the external inputs. If I give high rates, I erase it faster, and I erase it to a higher end point, right? If the network is bombarded by spikes all the time, it will stabilize at, hi at high synaptic weights. If you, if you bombard it at low frequencies, you will stabilize it at, at low weights. Is that clear to everybody? That's very intuitive, I think, no? When you give real data, if you give data that, that come from the, the brain of the animal, you, you have the same behavior. The network will converge, and it will converge to different levels of synaptic weights depending on the rate, but it will not converge to a narrow range of weights. It will converge to a very wide range of weights, as you can see here. Is that clear to everybody? Is everybody following this? Okay? Now, 
when I call real data here, it's not entirely real because what I did here was to concatenate a lot of waking, a lot of slow wave, a lot of REM. So I actually have an artificial long period of each state, like a pure state thing, which does not occur. The rats are polyphasic, so they keep changing the state. Then we decided to move one step further to reality and plug the actual data, you know, plug what the animal actually does. And we found something like this. Here you have the hypnogram, so if the animal is awake, is red. If the animal is in slow wave, is in blue. And REM is the green, very, very occasionally. Here you have the population, uh, 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 the, the, the sum of the response. So basically, the rate is going up and down. You see the rate is high during waking, is low during slow wave. And then you see the, the behavior of the network is much more messy. But you still have the same phenomenon, that when you're in waking, the weights converge to a higher value. When you're in slow wave, they drop. The weights converge to lower values. Okay? So it's basically the weights go up during waking and they go down during slow wave. And that's pretty much the Tononi model. That's what Tononi would predict. That's exactly it. He does it in a more complicated fashion, but the result is the same. Then we said, now let's model the LTP. Let's model this phosphorylation of chem kinase 2 or ZIF-268. doesn't matter, actually. Let's model something that is going to give a prize to some neurons, to some connections, but not on the millisecond range, on the 30 minutes range, much, much, much later. Depending on what happened now, I give a prize later. Okay? The way we did it was to let the animals go into sleep and then model this long-term Gaussian, this long-term bonus to the synaptic weights, which could be based on two different, inspired by two different mechanisms. In the first mechanism, we were inspired by a paper by Terence Sinovsky in the year 2000, in which he basically proposed that plasticity during sleep should be proportional to the amount of synchronous activity that happened during slow wave sleep. So we basically follow, this is slow wave sleep, we follow every time I have synchronous activity between neurons, I compute that, I integrate that, and I say, well, the, the height of this Gaussian will be proportional to the amount of synchronization I had between these two neurons. That's simple, maybe, too, maybe it's simplistic, but it's clear, right? And there are some... Meta, some biochemical reasoning behind this because the more synchronicity you have, the more opening of an MDA channels, the more calcium. We need calcium to activate kinases, so it's okay. Then we decided to do a different one, which was inspired by ourselves, which was basically to say, I, 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 I see that the weight is, is, va is varying over time during slow wave sleep. And then this is the transition to REM. If it was coming down and then it's coming up, in the short term, then I say, oh, this, this connection got activated in the short term. So if it got activated in the short term, let's give it a prize. Okay, so you're basically saying whatever happened in the short term, that's determinant of the long term in this transition of slow wave and REM. Okay, so we came up with this table here. If I, I give prizes for deflections going up, which if, if, I was, if that was real data, I would say, oh, what I'm measuring here is more calcium getting in. You know, the, the weight is going up, so that's an indication of more calcium getting in. I give a prize to that. Okay? So we model in those two ways. And then, of course, we have to vary. Let me show you the outcome before you, you, you ask the question that, as I can see, is building up. Um, what did we find with this? This is without the LTP. This is with the LTP, the first model that I showed you. This is the second model that I showed you. When you look at this, you say, well, actually, they... they they do what I expected, right? The weights go up because I'm applying LTP here. So I, see, I should see weights going up. But in this particular case, it seems to be very orderly. And here you don't seem to be, have a very orderly thing. You see weights that are, were very low, they became strong suddenly. They're crossing boundaries here. Okay? There's a way in which we can measure this very easily. I show you here with no LTP, I start with this uniform distribution, and most weights go down. So it's the downscaling that Tononi talks about. With the LTP model 1, most weights go up, get, get to be red. And with the LTP model 2, is more balanced. What for us was very interesting was to compare the Spearman correlation. The Spearman correlation will take into account not the absolute values, but it will take into account the position of values. It will rank all the synaptic weights. It will say, well, who was the first one? If Two hours later, the first one is still the first one. Even if the range was compressed to much less, ra smaller range, the correlation will be high. Is that concept very clear for everybody? 
silence means yes? Okay. So what is interesting is without LTP, I see the spearman correlation dropping slowly. Okay? As the network evolves, the positions are changing, the ranks are changing slowly. With LTP1, even though I increase synaptic weights, I increase them in an orderly manner. So it's actually almost the same. The ranks don't change. But when I apply the second model, then the ranks change a lot. So I basically have a restructuring of the trace. The trace is no longer the same. This is more clear and more interesting when I make several variations of the model. So this is no LTP. You see the, in red, you see the spearman correlation falling graciously. And this is just, just the, the, the total synaptic weight. When I apply LTP, Sainovsky style, for the entire slow wave sleep, I see an increase in the total synaptic weight and I see a decrease in the, in the spearman correlation that goes to the same levels. But then when, as I go to the other models, and even with the Sainovsky model, if I apply it only to the transition, I get this big drop in spearman correlations. And here with, the, with our model that depends on this angle here, I have a very strong drop. One way to appreciate this is qualitatively. So here you have the network with no LTP, you have a trace that is being erased. A network with LTP during the entire slow sleep, you get a strengthening of, of the trace which actually hits a ceiling. But if you start with a trace and then apply LTP just in the transition, you get a new trace. Why is this important? Because we know that sleep can produce the three things. Sleep can erase memories, sleep can strengthen memories, and sleep can change memories. Many times you wake up in the morning and you have the solution for a problem. And that problem, was not, it's not the strengthening of the solution you had yesterday. It's a new thing, right? The insights that you have on a problem is not just the strengthening of memories. It's the recombination of memories. And in this paper, even though it's, of course, a model and you can model anything, but we are arguing that with a single parameter, just with having or not having LTP, and the duration of LTP and when it happens, you can generate those three outcomes. The network can forget, the network can remember, and it can also change its, its original configuration. Now, what is it that I said that I wanted to, to bring to your attention to model? It's the, it's the toy model that we have, not for this, but for what comes after this. What is it? The relationship between regions. So we said that memories get to be corticalized and hippocampus independent over time. How can we make sense of that? For that, we need to remember that ZIF-268 is this gene that can couple what happens at the entry point of the neuron, the dendrites, to what happens at the exit, the axons, right? So calcium gets in. Minutes later, I have ZIF being transcribed. And hours later, I have synapsins being added here to the axonal terminal. So think that you have a downstream effect. By changing ZIF, you're changing the coupling between dendrites and axons. So how do we envision that this could work? Imagine that you have a very simple circuit. And then something interesting happens during waking that will activate this neuron. And this activation was so strong that it will activate the other neuron. The activation is in red at the level of the membrane, but if it gets to be really strong, it will produce gene expression, which I represent in green. Now, this gene expression, I said right uh, a minute ago, will lead to a downstream effect, right? So it will lead to an increase, I will represent as an increase in the synaptic strength downstream here, a few hours later. Okay? Now, the animal goes to sleep. Then I will postulate that because of this stronger connection here, when the animal goes to sleep, the reverberation will engage this neuron, which was not engaged before. And for the same reason, when the animal goes into REM sleep, I should engage this neuron here with gene expression changes that were not seen before. And now, because this has a long-term downstream effect, I will see a change here a few hours later. And then when the animal goes to sleep, now I engage a, 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 a longer chain of, of neurons. And now I engage genomically a long chain of neurons. So you see, what, is, what we're proposing here is that memories may be corticalized, it may move from hippocampus to cortex, not because of a system's property, not because the hippocampus and the cortex are doing something to remove the memory from here to there, but because every single neuron has a molecular machinery that couples 
the changes that happen now in the dendrites to changes that will happen six hours later in the axons. And because these genes get to be reinduced during sleep, every time the animal goes to sleep, you push the memory further and further down the road. So something like this. When you learn something new, you have plasticity waves in both cortex and hippocampus. What is that plasticity wave here? Oh, change in firing rates, change in synchronicity, change in the kinase phosphorylation, change in gene expression. I can measure it in many different ways, but I can see that it happens in both regions. However, in the hippocampus, they get to be attenuated. And in the cortex, they don't get to be attenuated. As a consequence, probably what's going on is that in the beginning, you involve the hippocampus and the cortex with new synaptic changes. But over time, they age. They don't get to be renewed in the hippocampus, but they do get to be renewed and propagated to different circuits in the cortex that eventually will move all your memories, long-lasting memories, to the cortex and leave the hippocampus free for new memories. This is exactly the toy model that I would like to transform into a more realistic model. And I have a question in the audience. No? Can I move? Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Five is good. So... If we were making um, imagetic metaphors, you would say this is the brain of a baby. You're born with very few memories. If a memory is a, is a, is a, is a river, is a, if a memory is a depression that can carry water, then here you have very few memories, right? The, mem the baby knows how to, how to cry, how to eat, how to, to sleep and learn, and, and pretty much that. But then that would be the, the brain of a, of a very end, old person. Right? How many different memories can you find here? How many different little rivers you can find here? It's not infinite, but it's a very large number. And then there's this debate. Right? When you go to sleep, what happens is that the deep parts of your brain will bombard your cortex with activity. So it would be equivalent to having a, a storm that is, you know, there's rain in part of the Grand Canyon. Uh, Crick, when Crick decided to become a neuroscientist, he published a paper in Nature in which he said, this bombardment is random. And because it's random, it will erase memories. It will basically, the, 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 the droplets of water, they don't know where they're going to fall. So they fall in any place and, and basically they're going to erode this, this topography. Okay? This is a powerful argument, but it's also a very flawed argument. Why? First of all, what is the introspection that you gain from this? Well, he said, well, that explains, he said, Crick said, that explains why dreams are so bizarre. I have a, ra a random bombardment of the cortex with activity, and that's why I have crazy dreams in which I'm naked and I do weird things. But that's not, that has nothing to do with me, right? It's not related to me. It's really my cortex forgetting. So dreams would be the spandrels of forgetting. As you forget, you, you dream weird stuff. That does not survive basic introspection, for example. And this is not an argument that I made. John Searle made this argument. A philosopher made this argument in a debate with Crick. He said, if this is true, you have a few thousand neurons bombarding tens of millions of neurons in the cortex in a random manner. Therefore, the chance of you ever activating the same pattern is zero, right? And he said, yes. And then said, well, here in the audience, how many people ever had a, re a repetitive dream? Can you please raise your hand if you had a, a repetitive dream? Well, that's the end of the theory, right? I mean, this theory cannot hold, uh, I mean, a repetitive dream is it's impossible if this is to really random. Mm -hmm. And even if you don't have the introspection, you know, we all know that people that go to war, veterans, they come back and they have nightmares, repetitive nightmares for decades, right, if they're not treated. So this is a staple of post-traumatic stress disorder, the repetitive nightmares. Let me... Let me just finish because... Let me, let me finish. So, so what is the flaw of the argument here? Yes, the droplet of water falls randomly. It doesn't know where it's going to fall. But once it hits the rock, the memory is in the rock. This water will be collected in the deeper, deep valley, right? If you went to the war and you saw horrible things, when you go to sleep, 
the energy, the activation goes to those paths that were most activated at some point with a lot of emotion and so on. So once you start the rain, once the rain hits the rock, everything is your history. And you're going to dream according to your history. When people that are attacked by sharks, they dream about sharks. They don't dream about anything else. Okay? I think I need to stop now because it's really late. And then the next time I have a chance to talk, we can talk about psychiatry and graphs. I think we need a, sec a separate conversation. Um, I just want to say, finish with one slide and say that there's a way in which we can read those phrases in a contemporary manner. Dreams contain day residues. Certainly, they reverberate memories at the electrophysiological and molecular levels. Okay? This is a contemporary way of saying the same thing. And when you say the dreams are the royal road to the unconscious, you could say the dreams allow access to one's memories and all their possible combinations. Right? The unconscious, if you substitute this phrase in any, any text by Freud, it fits very well. Unconscious as the collection of memories that you have and their combinations. And the second phrase I will not justify because that was related to the psychiatric data. I want to thank all the supporters of this work, even those that don't give any more money anymore, like Seni Peke and Capis, because we have the hope that they may resume. Uh, Pew Foundation, very important, and all the people in the Brain Institute. Obrigado, gente. Thank you. Uh, what we are doing in uh, an, another center that is sponsored by a National Science Foundation, and this is called Center for Science of Information. And I will tell you why I think it is related, actually, what you are doing, and why we need your help to analyze a few things. So this is a center that has 12 institutions from East Coast, Princeton, MIT, Purdue, who is the lead, uh, Urbana Champaign, uh, Texas AM, Berkeley, Stanford, and we added recently, actually, uh, Hawaii. So this is because this renewal that you had yesterday, we had a year ago. But it was not for three hours, but for 20 hours. But anyhow, we survived. So here's... It was very polite, but when, when they say, you, oh, I love you, it means they give you a bad referee, a review. You know how it is. <laughs> so uh, the idea of uh, the talk is the following. I know that you want to hear about science, so this is about science. But I want to tell you why we need to go beyond Shannon, be, beyond information theory, why information theory does not have good application in neuroscience, actually, in economy. We heard it today, and I will actually bring it up. I tell you a little bit about the people involved, because you can see whether you can relate to them and whether any collaboration can happen. And then I tell you a few things, and you probably realize why I'm, I was asking this naive question about structure and time, because this is one of the topics that we are really interested in. So let me start with Shannon. Uh, Shannon, uh, in 1948, wrote a paper, A Mathematical Theory of Communication, that started information theory, and some even say that the, the digital age began. Let me talk more about mathematics. Shannon did not create a theory of information, in my view, but he created very good a theory of communication, as he originally wanted to do it. And... Uh, in my view, he did three great things. The first one, for the first time, he defined what information is in his view. Uh, and at this time, he makes the right assumption, basically saying that semantics, aspect of communication, is irrelevant. Let me address a few issues. So what is information in, in Shannon's view? It is a reduction of uncertainty on the recipient side. What does it mean? Let's say I have several coins in my pocket. You don't know which one. You know that they are U.S. dollars, real, French, uh, Swiss franc, and so on. And once I pull one of the coins and show it to you, I'm reducing your statistical uncertainty because I have many others. And this is more or less what Shannon defined more precisely, and i show you later. Uh, he said that semantics, meaning doesn't matter for communication, and the example is the following. If you count the number of trucks on a highway, 
uh, uh, you don't care what do they carry, banana or tomatoes. But of course, for the recipient, it is matter whether he ordered banana and tomatoes came. So, from the recipient point of view, semantics matter, but not that was not what Shannon considered. Shannon was only interested in counting the number of trucks, efficiency of the traffic. Okay, so this is one aspect. The most important aspects were about two fundamental limits of compression and on communication. In compression, he had a very simple question. Uh, what is the minimum number of bits that I need to describe a file, a text, a structure? As his answer was very simple, actually. He said, on average, on high probability, when your phi is coming from some source that you can characterize statistically, you cannot compress more than entropy of the source. Very simple result, it is basically five lines proof. Okay? But the second result was much more interesting and much more difficult actually to ask the right question. He was asking them the following question. Okay, I want to communicate. I need hands to talk, unfortunately. When you want to communicate between two points, <laughs> yeah, you want to communicate between two points, and let's do a, a, an example. I want to transmit n bits, 0, 1, from one point to another, but my channel is noisy, okay? The question that he asked is, what is the maximum number of messages of size n I can transmit so that on the receive, uh, receiving side, I, with high probability, I could decode them? So uh, let's think. If I have n bits, the number of messages that I can do is 2 to the power n. If every of this sequence is a message that I want to send, one error basically change one message to another message. Very bad, high probability. So Shannon say, do not give me, do not, do not transmit two to the power n, but rather two to the power some number r. r is for rate. What is this number? So I transmit less, exponentially less. Why? because then I have much fewer messages that I decode. And the question is, what is the largest R such that when I transmit over a noisy channel, I can decode, discover all of them? Just to give you an example, I speak to you in a good Polish accent English. You understand me. Yes, we understand me for many reasons, because hopefully my English is not that horrible. But still, there is a lot of redundancy. So even if there is noisy channel between us, because I'm not using all English words or whatever, well, there is enough space that you can recover. So Shannon actually told you that the largest ray that you can transmit is something that is called capacity. And we come back maybe to this later. So this is what he did. And it was mostly from point to point. The problem is that nowadays information is not only communicated, it's actually organized, acquired, aggregated, valued in economy, represented, analyzed, inferred, and so on and so on. And we need to enlarge, in a sense, the topic of the conversation about, about Communication. Shannon actually wanted to do the hill objective was very simple. He wanted to transmit the data from one point to another in a rayable fashion. So you can recover the data on the other side. That's all. But these days we are doing much more than this. And we call this a large set of things, signs of information, which I sharpen a little bit in a second. And actually, I follow Cantor uh, Perceps, who was saying basically in science, asking questions sometimes more important than uh, answering. And I like that because this center is about asking questions. And actually, Shannon's contribution was, especially for this capacity problem, that he knew how to ask the question. 
And I believe the center that you are doing is also about sometimes asking the right question. Okay, so more specifically, in order to expand, so in order to expand theory of communication to a theory of information, science of information, uh, in the areas such as biology, economics, uh, big data, uh, knowledge extraction, and so on, neuroscience, we believe that we have to study at least four important aspects of information that was pretty much neglected. Structural information, temporal information, spatial information, semantics, context, in a dynamic environment that we are living with. By the way, when Shannon <laughs> discovered this result, it was asymptotics, and he completely ignored time. For him, time didn't matter. And you just saw in the previous talk that if information is transmitted and you do not, if it's not received in a timely fashion, bad things can happen. In economy, we don't have information of, of economy because, I believe, because we still don't know, understand information theory how to handle time. We don't know how much reduction of information is when the message arrives late. We know that should matter, maybe value of information, but we don't understand it very well. Semantics is another issue that we know right now is crucial, and we start doing something there, but still we are way far away on this. Now, my question about structure is because of this, and I will show you some results that we receive in this direction. Any questions so far? Okay. So, if, if you want me to describe what we are trying to do, we are trying to do three things. Fundamentals, so we call information communication, with involving how many bits do I need to describe a complicated structure, let's say, of a brain, and communicate. We want to deal with data because that's what we have to deal with right now, small data and big data. And one of the area, we call it a thrust, that we particularly concentrate in life science, not brain really, but life sciences. And I show you some results because we know that communication there, transfer of information is important. We do some others like uh, economists, we have economists who are, by the way, won Nobel Prize, but we will talk about this in a second. But we don't, we don't have a big group working in this area, okay? So again, I'm a very high level. I will go down to some specifics. So last year when I was trying to convince the reviewers uh, what is our plan for the next five years, I say that our paradigm is from data the information to knowledge. Now everybody knows what is data, but if you ask a simple question what is information, it's much harder. But I think I have a, a pretty good engineering definition of information. Information is a measure of distingu distinguishability. In order you, more, you have more distinguishable objects, then there is more information when you see something. So, and signals. If you have many distinguishable signals, then there is more information. Signal within the noise is not distinguishable. So you can actually make this more precise knowledge. I'm not gonna go there, except that in our setting knowledge, we understood information in action. So we extract information, uh, uh, the second uh, part, and then we apply it. So knowledge would be exactly, you extract information that is flying through uh, neurons, but at the end there is something that this information has to do and you want to measure how it impacts this. Uh, the center is actually quite unique. Uh, 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 National Science Foundation had probably about 15 centers like this so far. We are the most theoretical, which was which was very, a big surprise to everybody, including myself, that actually, uh, uh, actually we got 50 million to doing theory, not bad thing. And uh, you will see, uh, you'll see the um, state of people involved, but that's what we want to do. We want to understand, if, yes, we wanted them to produce algorithms, but we also want to understand 
and ask the fundamental question in the spirit of Shannon. Okay? And uh, so the idea is that good products combine theory and practice. You can see security versus crypto. Crypto is working quite well. There is a good theory behind it. And security is a complete mess. But it's much complex. Okay. So there's this big, big, big uh, 50,000 feet overview of what the objecting a goal is. Let me tell you a little bit about people involved so you can see whether you can relate to them. So we have formally four, five. I'm sorry? Be new. Be new, yes. Uh, Be new is actually one of the copy I. Uh, uh, Andreas from Stanford, Peter Shor, you know him probably, Sergio Verdue, it's the youngest um, uh, uh, Shannon Award winner. And BU is from Texas, but we had also Jack Gallant. Many of uh, you know him, Bill Biawek. And we have also other people like Todd Coleman and few others who actually, because of center, they went and tried to analyze brain and tried to find a communication information security model to understand what's going on. And... Uh, Bukhari is the, the uh, queuing theorist? No. Uh, no, 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 no. He's a he's information theorist. He's a dean right now, so science is gone. Uh, okay, so here are a few people, just so you know. We actually, Chris Sims, he's an economist from Princeton. 20 years ago, he built a theory. You did he got, it in two, he got it in 2011 when the center already exists, but for the work that he did 20 years ago. But he actually used information theory. Okay, so he has a few names. Just uh, you, you, uh, you can also look at the center. And okay, let me tell you how we organize work. We organize the work in three big groups. You saw the three bubbles. So we have three thrusts. One is this information communication. We have leader trust in this area. The other is big data, data science, and we have leaders here. And the, other, the, the last one is life, uh, life sciences. Mostly, I would say, related to uh, DNA, protein, and that kind of thing. Very little in brain, but there are some work being done. Okay, so I finish this uh, high-level description. Now I want to go to a few specific problems and some solutions. Uh, across the center, I don't know time, uh, but I, 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 will, I might skip some of them. Let's see how much time we'll have. So I always was fascinated with structure. I wanted to understand actually what structure is and how many bits do I need to describe it. And the motivation is simple. You have very different structure. There is a chart, organizational chart. There is some information in that. There is some molecule. There is probably protein, whatever. And, and actually, in 2003, there was a paper by Frederick Brook in JCMA, which is uh, JCM, which is a computer science journal, and the title was Three Great Challenges of 50 Years Old Computer Science. The first challenge was, do I have it here? Yeah, I have only his reference. The first one, extend information theory from sequences to structure. There is no information of structure. Everybody knows that bike, it's less complex than the car, but can you measure it? We, this is probably too hard a question, but on the molecular level, we might need to actually understand why, why, why some molecules are the, that more complex than the other. Do they carry any information uh, that we're missing at this point? Okay, I want to now show you a concrete result. Okay, I draw here a graph. And the first question I ask you, how many bits do I need to describe it? How many bits it tells me? But a more interesting question is the following. This graph has labels. Actually, these are the names of cities in Europe. All of these cities are in France, these are in Finland, and these are in Poland. These labels are correlated, locally correlated. 
these are locally correlated and these are locally correlated. So now the question is, with locally correlated levels, and you have this all the time, I show you in a second a real picture. It means that this France, this part, is the same. So when you compress it, when you have the number of questions, you don't need to repeat it. So they are statistically correlated. This, this level is related to this level. And you can build a statistical model. We actually did it. We just finished something, which actually we have a model for this. They share the same, the same level. Not the same level. For example, you can say, okay, here's a model that we recently created. This next level comes from this one in the following way. Let's say I generate this in some way. Then I go letter by letter, and there is a mark of relation between levels. So this letter will generate one letter that depends on the previous one. So I have a mark of correlation between levels. So there is color, vertical correlation versus, uh, uh, versus uh, no, horizontal correlation versus vertical correlation. In, in, you can see it. Uh, here is another example. This is a real example. This is protein-protein network, let's say, you, from... Uh, uh, from, again, 50,000 uh, feet. It looks like there is a structure there, and I want to know how many bits there, but actually, if I look at there, I this... Quite I know that you like it. And... <laughs> and... But... <laughs> the problem is that life is not that simple, uh, Remco. This... Uh, all of them here have some, actually, description through enzyme, whatever, by the way, this structure here, the tree. Now, all of this through, let's say, ontol gene ontology, you have another structure that you have text, but this is the directed acyclic graphs. So what do I have in this picture? I have several structure, uh, uh, unlabeled graphs, trees, tags, the, disc, uh, the, the ducks, and this is real. And you want to know how many bits I can describe it. Okay, so that's what we actually we got grant from NIH, National Institute of Health, to do uh, uh, compression like this. Okay, I can't do it yet, but I can do something simple. Structure. So, a little bit of uh, mass. So, here's a question that uh, how we formulate it. And, uh, as, sure. Shannon, been your reasoning, uh, compression associated to the fact that you, as, you assign a stochastic model to a sequence of symbols. So what is the probabilistic? I will show you on the next. So here is the real solution. Okay? So I want to only understand structure, no levels. But I go from a level graph to unlabeled graph, and I will ask, I will, I want to compress this one. So here, uh, not difficult question today, please. <laughs> I will define you for specific one here. Okay, so look what I, how I define structure. I have three vertices, and I have eight different level graphs. But you, you agree that this structure is different than this structure, different than this, different than this. I have four structures. I have three isolated vertices, one uh, the edge, two edges, three edges. So that's what I define structure for this model. And by the way, what is this probability? If I generate by according to some probability, Erdos-Renyi, let's say, a preferential attachment, then this structure if within this uh, is uniform distribution, is basically equal structure of any element here times the number of elements in each of this. So number of levels that you can permute in order to get one structure, but it's more complicated than that. You have graph entropy according to the original model, and you have structural entropy that we define this way. And actually, we know this is the lower bound, but the question is, how they are related, how we can find an algorithm that achieves this lower bound. So where is the problem here? Automorphism. Look at this graph. 
uh, you see structure very clearly how it is, but I put labels because we start with the label graph because it's easier to generate. I can permute, permute this label. I can put this A here. It doesn't, make, doesn't change the structure. So the number of permutations is 5 factorial, 120, but that is not the right answer because if I flip B and C and D and E, I'm getting exactly the same structure. So the number of different uh, permutational labels that lead to the same structure is 120 divided by 2. Actually, the automorphic group Cardinality is 2, so more or less, in this particular case, n factorial divided by automorphism of that. Uh, then there is a relation between structural entropy and graph entropy, and the difficulty is here. How you can estimate the cardinality of automorphic group, and this might be actually quite big, but sometimes it might be quite small. So let me uh, do a simple thing and then tell you a few things that we are working on. If I have an Erdos-Renyi graph, rem uh, I remind you what is Erdos-Renyi graph. I have n points, I pick up any pair, and with probability p, I put an edge. I will start with 1 minus p, I do not put an edge. So p is the probability of an edge. How many edges do I have? N choose 2. Yes? If, and, and this is Erdos-Renyi, uh, Branko described it for you before. Uh, tomorrow, okay. So you have a, a, a you have preliminary discussion, okay. Um, if p is not too small, not too large, you don't want isolated nodes, you don't want complete graphs because they have symmetry, then uh, Kim, Wu, and uh, Sudakov in 2006 prove that for Erdos-Renyi graph, Automorphism group is basically one. It means there is no symmetry. So if it is one, this goes away. And then the entropy comes from these two points. So uh, uh, structural entropy is given by this term. But these two are very important. I explain to you in a second. By the way, we have something that uh, information theory is called asymptotic equal partition property. If I pick up a random unlabeled graph, its probability is basically given by this. Okay, this is easy. This, everybody can do it. The question is to find an algorithm that compresses unlabeled graph not even to the first term, but to the first two terms. Why not to the first term? Because here, I need my In Erdos-Renyi model, all of these ones are completely independent. So I have n choose two elements. Some of them are one, this might be p. So the entropy of such a guy is n choose two hp. How I will compress such a how I will compress such a, a graph, such a matrix? I read it row by row. Apply Lampel's if. Bingo. But it's a little harder if I want to do a little more. Why do I need a little more than when this is n square and this is n log n? That's the difference. If you feed one half, you can compress. Yes, you can't compress random string. Okay. Never, because HP is one. Yeah. And I told you you can compress I t up to entropy. So you can basically the ratio of your original to the so is one. Yes, flipping a coin you can't compress. But uh, why, why I want to compress to two terms? This is important. This, is, this grows like n squared, just like n log n. This should, is much bigger than n. But p does not need be, to be constant. If p, for example, is some log n over n, I need connected graphs, then these guys are basically of order n log square n. This is on len, n log n. They are almost the same. Okay, so now I describe to you, I show you a small demo. And I promise I will not go beyond my allotted time. I will show you a small demo how I do the compression. And we'll tell you a little bit about how we analyze and prove mathematically that this compression scheme 
can compress up to the first two terms. So, by the way, I'm going to compress this graph without labels. I use labels only to explain to you. With these two strings, so here what I do, I choose randomly a node, and I will store the number of neighbors. Not who are the neighbors, but the number of neighbors. So I'm a story guy. I have four neighbors. I store number 0, 1, and I put it here. By the way, here I will be growing something tree, which you never see it, but it's important for me to analyze it. Uh, you have to ask my students, probably for implementation. I think he wanted to have every node to be 4 bits. Because, by the way, n is equal to 10, you need 4 bits for the decoding, it's probably easier. Okay, so what I do next? Okay, so now neighbors of y are this, non neighbors are this. I'm going to choose one guy from the neighbors. Which one am I going to choose? I don't know. Oh, first of all, I deleted i and edges. I'm choosing f, and I'm going to do the same. I'm going to store the number of neighbors of both. So here what I have, I have three and two, and I concatenate them. By the way, I also remember from the beginning the number of nodes. And by the way, I will continue. Let me do it quicker a little bit. At some point, something happened. Okay, why I do have two strings? I don't need it, except that the second one I know how to analyze mathematically. I'm sorry? This is not a, a suffix code. No, no. No, no, it will be a prefix code because at the end I will apply arithmetic encoding. Right now I'm describing to you a description. Okay, so look, at some point I put in, the, this is the tree that uh, visualizes the analysis. At some point uh, uh, nodes will have only one neighbor and then I, uh, I describe them by uh, the square in this tree, and every time you have a single neighbor, I put the information here. The only reason is that I know the statistical property of this string, I don't know this one. I know that this is basically Bernoulli P when P is the original tree, so at the end, okay, once I have this two, so the whole graph, this is irrelevant, this is for me to analyze, the whole graph is described by concatenation of these two strings and applying, let's say, some obvious encoding, let's say, arithmetic encoding on this concatenation. So, it's, so when I decode, no, when I decode it, I'm getting isomorphic structure. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The labels are different story, but I will tell you in a sec. So here's the whole description of this graph. This is to analyze. So what I want to prove, and this is, I like this information very much. Information theory tells you the following. Shannon told us you can compress up to entropy, but he didn't tell us how to find algorithms that compress up to this entropy. So now I assume that my graphs are coming from the class of Verdochenie, doesn't matter which one. And I will prove you using this tree that my, up, my, my upper bound, lower bound is entropy, the, upper, the, the number of bits that when I concatenate this and apply uh, arithmetic encoding, uh, lampadie, whatever, I need that many bits, no more. By the way, this part is exactly the same as this one. This part exactly like this one. This is not. There is some fluctuation here, but of the same order. So this algorithm shape seems to be working well for it's asymptotically optimal up to two terms. And actually, in practice, it works very well. Uh, we are getting from 20 to 40 percent improvement. But as Renko will notice, none of these graphs are the genie. And this is true. Uh, uh, so it is uh, basically robustness, but we don't have mathematical proof, so we have questions to ask. Uh, how to extend uh, non to non erdosvenie graph? And I tell you a little bit because we know this. So let's take preferential attachment graph that Remco will talk tomorrow. I tell you a little bit about this. Yeah, but uh, Albert Barabashi, Barabashi, 
And can we extend this analysis to this graph, which, is, which many, uh, I would say, many real models are, are better described by this or some version of this? So the problem with, yes, no. So the problem that I need to, okay, I don't want to go back because my model, but you, you notice that in the structural entropy there was one term that I was able for Erdogan to ignore because Erdogan was asymmetric, automorphic group, cardinality was one. So what is the cardinality of the automorphic group for uh, preferential graph? For m equal 1, you're building a tree, so there is a lot of symmetry. We had experimental results showing that for m equal 2, 3, 4, 5, there is no symmetry. But then we proved that for m equal 2, with positive probability, there is a little symmetry. We don't know, and I work with Fanta Janssen, who some of you who are working in random graph know that he is one of the best in the area, and we couldn't go beyond m, m equal in M equals 3? And M is equal to 2. Uh-huh. Transposition. Ah. So, um, I mean, it depends on your starting graph. But you can have starting graphs which are such that after uh, connecting the second vertex, the thing becomes completely symmetric. And then after that, it will be completely symmetric. So, so actually, what we discovered is that there is a transposition, transposition like this. And you basically can switch, and this happens positive probability, we c probably not probability one, I'm pretty sure. Probably small probability, but it happens. But for m equals three, we couldn't figure it out. So we don't know whether we, I can prove to you theoretically that this graph compression works well uh, uh, in theory, but I know that in practice it works well. Uh, another thing, correlated levels, I tell you in a second because we just, for the renewal, we just finished some work in this, and I show you a poster. Lossy extension of this. So what about if I want to discover a structure, not exactly, approximately, but of course there are some problems how you define approximately, because uh, maybe here. Let's say I have a graph that looks like this. Deleting this edge is okay, but deleting this edge is change everything. So we don't have a good uh, distance that will help us. I, I, we can extend it for one distance that is uh, pretty much useless, but for in, a, in practical application. And finally... Many of the network models that are being investigated actually do have independence of the edges, but they are inhomogeneous. Okay. okay. So it depends whether you tell me about automorphism. Uh, do you think the automorphism is there? That, that's what I need to know. The class of homogeneous inhomogeneous random graphs. This class might have the, uh, the same property as, as the other training. But this is just a discussion. Okay. So, uh, of course, a unimodal data structure. Okay, so, so by the way, this is, you can't read it, but this is exactly what we finished and we're going to present for the, our annual report, that we know how to treat uh, trees with correlated labels. So, basically, correlated labels mean that whatever I generate here, uh, or whatever I generate here depends on here, through some Markman property, and we have an algorithm that actually achieves optimal compression. So you can read it. Okay. How do I do? Okay, 20 minutes. Uh, so I'm going to go quickly through that part. Basically, why information theory is not working very well, or not achieving the same success in communication in big data? Because most information theoretical models, static models, are relatively simple. Even if you go to stationary regarding model, it's not what big data have. They are dynamic, they are uh, complex dependency between some structural dependency, high dimensional, heterogeneous, and so on and so on. And usually what many people observe that the method that works for some data or smaller data does not scale up. And a, a journal is actually summarized it very well. Big data has arrived, but big insight have not. <laughs> 
I like it very much, actually, and we are still working. There was a, a colossal um, a failure of Google, the so-called flu graph, that they apply simplistic tools and they miss something because exactly because of this. So, which is good for us. Uh, okay, let me explain you only the model. So, what, what is the question that you're asking? And this is done in Stanford, my calling in Stanford. So, Shannon objective was to reproduce in a rareable fashion data. But that's not what you are doing. Some of you are probably on the internet querying. These days, we do more querying than sending data. And you want, when you query, incomplete database, always incomplete database, you want to get an answer that is as close to the true answer as possible. This is an example. Uh, this could be represent Netflix problem. So what do you have? You have huge distributed matrix. Each row is one user. And you put your preferences. Some users put a lot of preferences. My wife buys a lot of things, so they know everything about her. I'm not buying anything, so they don't know anything about me. So my row is not, well, they don't have enough information about me, but they have enough information about some other users. So you have incomplete distributed database. This incomplete list is information theory done by compression. And on the other side, based on the profile of the user, they want to design what kind of advertisement give it to you. But if they don't have enough information, they cannot hit you, thank God. And, and, and uh, the question is, actually, for Netflix, do you want to invest another $10 million in your advertising if you know that it is unachievable? Because they can tell you that there will be incomplete database, and you can only achieve certain levels. So this problem, which solves big problem information theory, so-called multi-user uh, source coding problem, answer is this. this is another problem with incomplete database. Let's say you have huge database of DNA that you cannot store. You can only store in your cache something, signature of database, whatever it is much fewer information. And a query comes, and the query has this cache memory, which has incomplete information. Is X that arrive, let's say my new DNA, I'm asking, is it is already there in the database that, to which I do not have access? I have access to incomplete database that has signature. So the question is, how few bits do you need to store here in order to answer with high probability? A different question that Shannon asked. And people are doing this. Okay, let me skip this. Uh, Twitter, this is the example that I love it because we did it. So uh, here's a stringology, and uh, I love stringology. So when you have two strings, you want to ask how close these two strings are. To DNA or to Twitter? The answer that with my colleague Philippe Jacquet uh, from, uh, from now Bell Lab, but he was in India, was the, uh, we claim that you can measure similarity of two strings by counting the number of common subwords. Here's an example. Uh, I have two words, banana and ananas, a number of common subwords is here. I only want to know the number, actually. So this number, and I want to know the average. Because I want to apply the, the discriminator to actually to classify tweeters. And I will tell you in a second. And tweeters are very short. You need very precise analysis. Uh, so actually, uh, Oh, this is an example that I really love personally. A very simple question that even I can understand, whose analysis is very complicated. And actually, I only show you the final result. We apply complex analysis, uh, uh, flagellary, as we call uh, analytic combinatorics. Uh, each matrix of, uh, was uh, to the power of complex numbers. We computed the eigenvalues, blah, 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 blah. 
And here what we got, interesting result, that actually is useful. When both strings are generated statistically by the same source, then string, joint string complexity grows linearly with n. But if they are generated by different source, they grow sublinearly with kappa that is smaller than one, which depends on the eigenvalues of this matrix. So why it is important, for example, uh, we compare English to French, English to Greek, and English to Polish somewhere, and clearly you can see a band, and you can clearly see that they are not linear, they, are, they have differ different statistics. My colleague applied to classification of Twitters, which are very short, and actually they did quite well. I understand, uh, this is, by the way, the book that we just published about stringology uh, uh, with uh, Philippe Jacquet, where more about this kind of uh, question about stringology you can, you can find. Okay, life sciences. Okay, I'm going to skip maybe, uh, maybe quickly. So here, David said uh, in Berkeley, for a long time, we understand what is DNA resembly, what it is. See, we have a long 10 to power 9 DNA genome, but we cannot read it. We have to split it into small parts and read it in small parts. And many algorithms exist for the last 20 years, but David was the first one who asked the right question. He said, given the statistic of this, uh, how reliable the reconstruction process is, how many the small part, what we call the reads, we need, and of one length, so that we can assure that with high probability you reconstruct the original string. And if you know it, then you can construct algorithms that achieve this. And that's what they did. So here what they did, and I can describe to you. In a, uh, N is the number of reads. L is the length, so you can see this time C is 10 to the power 10. You have much more than this one. Of course, you need it because you need at least two conditions. You need so many that they cover the whole thing. This is called coverage. And Waterman did long time ago. What you call reader is, is it more pieces? They, they, yes. They yeah, number of pieces, yeah. But you need another property. study for a long time, and it turns out it grows like log n with, uh, with secondary new entropy. And here what you have, this blue area is what you can reconstruct. You need at least the number of strings that do coverage, and at least this what I described to you in order to avoid ambiguities. Okay. And actually, okay, real data is not memories in Markov. But still, this is a bound, and they find many different algorithms that are closer and closer to this bound. So this is like in data compression, when we know that entropy is a bound, and we find algorithms that achieve this. Here, they have a different problem, but they have the same philosophy. Okay? Okay, the last one for uh, Remco, because he's interested in this problem. Uh, it is mathematically extremely challenging problem. Let me give you a quick motivation. The quick motivation comes from, from some observation in proteins. If I plot, so structure, which is called folding, versus strings versus proteins, you divide somehow proteins, some families, and the same with, with uh, structure, and they observe in log-log graph that there is basically linear, linear relation, like deep flow, there are very few sequences with uh, many structure, like in words, E and Z occur, occur very often, or A and Z. And the bi biologists came to us and said, can you explain this? So we built a model, and I think the model is more interesting. And I will try to explain this model to you. So as an input, I have a protein that I reduced to two letters polar and hydrophobic. So instead of 20, I put two. Okay, I have a channel that I describe in a second. Let me explain to you, uh, and this is, this biologist did for some time, how you can somehow get some information about the structure. 
And this is basically a self-avoiding walk. Uh, let me draw this. Uh, I had it once, but my colleagues erased it. <laughs> So the output is basically square, square root by n square root of n. n is the length of my original sequence. By the way, I noted that we are doing sequence to structure. And then I have points, lattice points here. This is square root by when square root of n, I have n points. And I draw through all of these points a walk that does not cross each other, self-avoiding walks. There are many of them. We don't know exactly how many, by the way. Many things are not known in this model. Once I have this walk, I look at the input sequence and I assign H, P, H, P, and so on. So for example, if you see here, color, this is H, this is P, H, H, P, P. Okay, so this is self-avoiding walk. So I transform this channel, transform this sequence of lengths, yes. How do we get, so if we have N, N uh, letters, then they're exactly N points, how do we get the first of all, the are How we are getting what? First of all, the corners are missing from the your graph. picture. But the, the second issue is that if we know that the self-avoiding walk, walk has to fill all the graphs. Yes, it is a Hamiltonian path. That was our assumption. You have to go through all points. And even then, we don't know how many of them are. <laughs> Ask him. <laughs> Actually, uh, even the only thing that we know, and we have still disputed, that if you go from a corner to corner, in this model, you're filling all of them, the uh, log of the number of walks divided by n converges to s constant. But if I go from a side to side, I don't know. So very little is known. So you see what's happened. I have uh, uh, five minutes. I have this walk. And now for this walk, I assign an energy to this walk. This node energy depends on its, uh, on each uh, uh, neighbor that are not sequence neighbor. So for example, this doesn't count, this counts. How do you make this pass? I believe that was the same core, uh, or this one now. So this pass, I do any self-avoiding pass. I have many, any. And then I label it with the input sequence. And when I label it, then this pass acquire energy. How I compute energy? Every node I consider points that are neighbors but not sequence adjacent. So for example, neighbors to this is this, is this, but not this, not this. And I have a matrix that a biologist gave it to me and I compute for every of this label self-avoiding work and that energy. It grows linearly. That's all what I can tell you. What you want? You want, uh, you want, uh, you want, uh, you want a fault that has minimum energy. That's what people will tell you. But so this, what this, what this channel does, it transforms the sequence into this structure with the following probability. This is a conditional probability. Probability of this sequence is transformed to this fault by Boltzmann distribution. Beta is inverse of uh, temperature. This is energy, and, and this is partition function. Okay? So uh, you want to know, in this case, how many uh, different uh, sequences I can transmit and recover the, uh, the best folding for the, this is like, a, this described like the noise in this sequence. By the way, we use it, and actually we could understand and explain the picture that I show you, but here's a few for much interesting thing. When I compute, when we compute it experimentally, the capacity, the capacity there, defined properly, 
It turns out it has a phase transition when beta increases, when temperature increases. Very unusual phenomenon. So we have, so whatever I tell here, most of the things are not true. By the way, we cannot, okay, they are true probably, but we cannot prove it. We can prove few things. First of all, what I'm interested here, I want to compute mutual information between uh, sequence and folding, which is what? Entropy of the folding mind and minus conditional entropy. When I do maximization of this, over the uh, input, the distribution of the sequence of this capacity, basically. But I only tell you now something, three minutes, two minutes, a little bit how to compute this conditional entropy. It turns out that this conditional entropy is expected value of log of the partition function minus, basically, uh, Energy. Energy grows linearly in this case. But this is a big problem. This, every statistical physics who's working this know it. Uh, and Talagrand has a beautiful book about this. Uh, basically, what we expect, and we can prove this, that when I take divided by log of the number of uh, self-avoiding walks, then it converges to something that is called free energy which is very hard to compute. But in order actually to, and so this is the expression you can, uh, that depends on what? It depends on the number of self-avoiding walks. And at this, this is not true. We don't know it. We know it for one specific case. When you start from this corner to this corner, you fill it up. We know that the limit exists. We don't know what the limit is. But for any other, we really don't know. We expect it might be true, but we don't know how to prove it. So this is this log mu. The interesting thing is that you can prove this is only upper bound that we can prove, which is very, not very tight, actually, that depends on the temperature you have actually phase transition. So let me tell you what we are able to prove. This upper bound, which is not good in some cases, we can prove that this is a tight upper bound when beta goes to zero for some special matrices. I think that's all, yes. I'm on time. <laughs> now we speak 40 minutes. <laughs> no. Let me ask uh, sure. two questions. Did you succeed putting your colleagues, neuroscientists, uh, discussing with your colleagues probabilistic statisticians, do these people... So, so you know Bill Bialek is actually using information theory and trying to understand a few things. So he's already on his own. Jack Gallan actually worked with Binu. This, uh, this, yeah, yeah, this actually result that uh, one of you are mentioning about the recogni uh, recognizing of uh, images was with Binu. Yes, wow. yes. Yes. Uh, there are a few others from information theory communication. Andrea Goldsmith is one, Ted Coleman, and so on, who are actually very interested in this and trying to apply more information theoretic tools. I think nobody doubts there's flow of information in the brain. Nobody, I don't know, you might be understand. I don't understand. We would like to build, as usually people in the more engineering side, a simple model that explains few phenomena and uh, uh, networks is one, and try to understand, you know, in a dynamic network, chain, changeable network, how we can, what we can say a little bit about the model. So there are a lot of interest in this, and uh, bringing information theory tools, I also believe algebraic tools should be brought, but that's a different story. We can learn something, we can build models, and I believe that models are what is missing. Very similar, very close. Very close. Yes. So there is, there is some area of which uh, information theory adopted inference and hypothesis testing that they are basically using information theory tools. Large deviation is definitely area of probability, but information theory actually make important contribution for uh, finding uh, convergence to entropy, and actually you can, uh, Caesar is the guy who actually 
start the information theory from a large deviation from information theory. There is a lot of correlation. There is a lot of correlation. No doubt about it. Listening says that learning means to know how to compress data. Okay. Uh, Jorma is a great friend of us, mine, and uh, Antonio. I had long conversations with him. He is so politically incorrect that I love <laughs> that. But here what is important, information is not entropy. It's not about compression, in my view. Information is about regularity property, which means when you subtract entropy, there is still some regularity property. It's called redundancy. That was the useful information is there. Uh, entropy is useless, it's randomness. It comes from some kind of randomness. The regularity stay after subtracting it. And information theories did a great job because this is called Minimax and some others that we actually can understand this uh, redundancy of a large cloud of processes. And actually we know that this redundancy grows either log n or in a different way, depending on what class of processes. For Markov, we know it grows like log n, which is the price for estimating parameters. But for non-Markov, we know it grows other. For renewal process, we know it grows like square root of n. So there is very nice relation there. But yeah, I, regularity is something, property that we're missing and trying to understand for more complicated models and sequences, I would say. In the beginning of your presentation, you said that time is difficult to manage. What would be your intuition to put time in such biological structures? Just if I knew this, I probably would be in different place. But uh, so we are making some progress. So Sergio Verdu uh, was asking a simple question. Okay, you do, uh, here, is the, here is the model. And this, you want the largest R that this happened. Shannon proved that in the middle limit, when N goes to infinity, uh, you would normalize it converges to uh, capacity. When N is large, it means that the input sequence is bigger and bigger. It means it gives you more delay because you have to wait in the last bit until you receive it. So the, in this sense, when you have delay, we can answer a few questions. We know basically uh, uh, the rate of convergence for mathematician, which, which has interesting property. But this is point-to-point -point communication, very simple. There are some other people like Pierre Kumar, who is asking a little different question. Okay, in the wireless network, when you have changeable top topology, uh, different uh, delays and so on, um, how much actually I can transmit in such a situation or what are the best protocols that can achieve it? But nobody really asking the question that I would like to know it, exactly in the same that in brain and economy is important. And in, in economy, value of information is more important than information. You have to define what is value information. Here's one definition. In this case, value of information measured in dollars which is fine, and how much profit I will get from informed action versus uninformed action. If you give me one bit of information, how much I can gain? Some people have this definition, but many disagree with it. So anyhow, here, uh, if you do not react uh, uh, that for, re for a reason, people say money, time is money, yes? Okay, because in that, in this case, in economy, you have to react with a small uh, interval in order to achieve your goal. The same we see with the living cell. If, if, on a, if you have a symptom or, or outside action and your living cell does not react in a, some interval, bad things happening. So the information has only value at least or can, can be transmitted with a given interval. Not, not much was done in this. There is some, my friend Philip Jacquet with whom I did the stringology, he has a, a very interesting model for wireless, but uh, I, I can tell, describe to you. So the, the, we are trying, it's a very hard question.
a very hard question. And that's why information theory is not, does not find a lot of application and, and uh, funds outside communication. When you compress data, compression takes some time. So with zip, the first string is very bad, and then you have the problem of uh, stu studying the rate you, you, you achieve the maximum compression. But then when you look at the finite graph, you don't have this. So you should think about a graph which is being generated, something like this. Okay, so the, the philosophy is the following. Uh, from, let's say, computer point of view, the next file that you store is kind of random. So what information theory is doing, and this is a, a step of faith, he is assuming that your next file is coming from a class of probability, memoryless, Markov, stationary guard. If you know this, then information theory tells you exactly what happened. But you have to believe in that, that part. Okay. And this is statistical model selection. Yes. yes. The name statistical model. Exactly. So a final, final question. Uh, Daniel Takahashi, two days ago, he, he said, oh, if you want to look at uh, um, uh, unitary data from neurons, look at 50 neurons, something like this, it's impossible to get all the information needed because you have lots of information come from outside. So this is a problem. And then to solve it, for instance, we assumed that influence does not come from very far away, which probably is wrong. And then he said, yes, but maybe this is not useful. We don't need to... I agree with this. But uh, uh, how do you put it, it in, uh, this, in this framework? So, uh, I don't know. Uh, the way I l look at uh, his question was, you know, I tried to reverse it a little bit because I know if fMRI or some other, uh, when you collect data and you know that these data are not certain, which means in some graph representation, some edges are missing or not, so maybe what you can do, you can create a graph that is most likely to occur within the class of the uh, distribution that you can assume is reasonable for the source. And maybe then you will get actually the best you can with, with the data that you have. Well, we were speaking about uh, being able to predict in the best possible way using this idea of uh, Oracle, uh, yeah. that the French people, what's the name, uh, Pascal Massard, like so much. So do you have an oracle here? No, we don't have it. No, we didn't, no. But I can see that this is a very good question, a very good problem. Okay, thank you.